So that is a great, wonderful, I wish we could see if have a talk to the We still have to get more. And a bit more people should come, you know. Okay. And then I have some front. Okay, I, I saw him. I saw him in a moment. Yes, yes. So, cut the facts, so then you will say yeah. a few things, then yeah. I will yeah. show the practicalities, and then and then we start with you. And then you start with you. Okay. Welcome, everybody. So we're still waiting for the director to make a few words before we start. But it's a pleasure to see you all. I think it has been very hectic in the last few months. I was very excited about organizing COSMO. Actually, I was uh, in the first COSMO conference in 1997 in the Lake District. And I remember that occasion as a fantastic time when I was learning a lot about cosmology, obviously. 97, you can imagine. And uh, organizing one of these big conferences, it's always a strain, but it's, it's also a pleasure, especially if it goes out and works out well. So hopefully uh, we will manage this year. Uh, it's This auditorium fits 252 people, counting these chairs over here. And uh, of course, maybe the first day we don't have as many, but eventually through the week it will be packed. So please remember to enter early into the, into the hall and occupy all the seats. So we will have a, a very uh, busy uh, schedule, as you've noticed, 20 parallel talks and more than 250 or so, uh, sorry, 20 plenary talks and 250 uh, parallels distributed among many, many sessions. It's true that some of them, of course, uh, in the lateral structure, for instance, we had to fit in two at the same time, but otherwise uh, the subject will be sufficiently clear that you can choose among them. Uh, hopefully also the, the weather will be uh, fine. That was not obvious. Uh, you might think, oh, I'm coming to Madrid, so that's a, a great place, it's always sunny. Well, that's not quite true. Last week we had fantastic storms. We had a, a Dan actually, a complicated storm. And hopefully there will be no water coming from the ceiling. <laughs> but if it continues raining as it did last week, uh, we might be in trouble. Nevertheless, uh, this is a brand new auditorium, so you should be uh, enjoying it. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, there will be some practical issues that uh, Sabas will tell you uh, right after uh, Pepe's uh, welcome speech. And uh, but otherwise, I, I think I'll just pass the the mic to to Pepe to introduce the institute. Thanks. Thank you, Juan. Okay, so uh, welcome everybody. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jose Barbón. I am uh, serving as director of the Institute of uh, Theoretical Physics. And therefore, it falls to me the honor of uh, welcoming you here. A sizable portion of the cosmology community. It's like a pleasure to have you around. For all of, the, for all of you who are, are not familiar with the place, uh, let me just tell you that this institute is relatively young. Uh, it was founded like uh, about 20 years ago. And uh, 
about 10 years ago, we moved to this building, which uh, we share with uh, the Institute of Mathematics. There's, there's two towers, one tower is physics, the other is mathematics. And uh, right about the same time, uh, we became uh, part of a cluster of excellence uh, called the Severocho cluster, which allowed us to have a large activity of uh, organizing workshops and conferences. And uh, this is uh, about uh, the last one we are trying. I have to say that uh, this conference is probably the largest that we are trying to organize. Uh, I think that um, we are sort of testing the limits of what we can do here in this building. So I, I ask for your patience in case those limits become very obvious. Um, in any case, I would like to thank uh, the local organizers, the local cosmology group for being so brave as to putting this together. And uh, we all hope that you have a great time here in the IFT and in Madrid during this week. So thank you. Okay, so before we start, I will mention very briefly some practicalities. So, so you have already seen the program of the workshop of the conference. So everything is on the website. So all the plenary talks will take place here in the yellow room or also called Salon de Actos in Spanish, which is where we are right here, okay? Now the parallel sessions take place in the yellow room, blue room, red room, and orange room, and the, the program is color coded. So actually, uh, this is the this takes place in the yellow room, the blue room, red room, and orange room. And I will show you exactly what they are in a moment. Okay. Oops. So this is uh, the layout of the IFT. So this is the main auditorium, the yellow room where we are right here. If you go to the left a bit on the other side, this is the blue room. If you go a bit on the right and in the back is the red room. And if you go all the way to the left, there is the orange room, which is in the side of the mathematicians where the dragons are, you're not supposed to go there. And in the front, there is, is where the registration happens. So you already know this. There are also toilets on the left and on the right of both sides of the corridor. And right in the front of the, in the entrance, there is the cafeteria where we will serve the lunches and the coffee breaks and so on. Here are also, there are some stairs that go down to the IFT dungeons. Here you can find vending machines if you want like a sandwich or whatever. There are also more toilets and so on. And there are also, there's also a library. Now, finally, uh, about the lunch and the coffee break. So we will provide lunch boxes right in front in the entrance. And, uh, but it is um, necessary to wear your badges all the time. So, so when you are in the building and so on, you should always wear your badge, okay, for security reasons and so on. And also in order to get your lunch box, you need to wear your badge, okay, so that we know who is actually participants because there are so many people. Now, uh, we have also tried to accommodate people with allergies, but in case of any problems or doubts, please talk to Monica or also the catering people. And uh, this we will place in a different table just for convenience. Now about the Wi-Fi, so here you can find the network. So it's called IFT with a password, PMW 1910. Also, we can share it. And also we have a portable routers installed throughout the Institute. And here the password, so the name of the Wi-Fi connection is IFT router with a number and the password is RUTR23, okay? We will also distribute it to everybody if you have a problem. Of course, it's better if you use your mobile data plan, especially for uh, European people that have unlimited data and so on, it's better to use your data plan, okay? Now, uh, one last thing is that uh, also the plenary talks, also this thing happening right now is streamed in the blue room. So if you want uh, to find some place which may be a bit more quiet or whatever, you can also go to the blue room, which is a bit to the left and to the back, okay? And finally, uh, information for the dinner will follow in the coming days also with uh, an email. And uh, that's it. Okay. So I think we can start. Thank you very much, Savas. So we are ready now to start the uh, plenary sessions. We have Phil, Phil Bull. Unfortunately, Isabel uh, had her flight cancelled. So we will not have her talk today after Phil. That means that we will initiate the the coffee earlier so that you have more time to talk among yourselves and get introduced to the whole institute so here we have phil thank you for coming Great. thanks very much can you hear me on the mic is it working excellent thanks very much uh first a uh, big thank you to the organizers for inviting me and putting on this conference in a lovely venue 
Um, and in the spirit of cultural exchange, I hope you're grateful for the Manchester weather that I brought with me yesterday. Uh, sorry about that, folks. Um, so today I'm going to talk about 21 centimeter cosmology, um, which actually turns out to be quite a large subject with many different facets. I'm sort of going to give you the the the, the broad overview version, um, and I'm, I'm going to apologize straight away. It is quite a big field for all of the people I'm not citing in this talk. Uh, if you come to me after, I will cite you verbally. Um, so sorry about that in advance, um, but let's get going. So. Um, Here's an overview. I'll talk about the motivation for 21 centimeter cosmology. Why are we even bothering doing it? Uh, then I'll talk about different observational approaches. Um, I, I think it's fair to say most cosmologists weren't, weren't very used to radio telescopes until quite recently. Um, we've sort of more naturally been working with microwave and optical. Uh, there are some fun quirks of radio telescopes that are interesting to deal with. So I'll talk a bit about that. Um, then I'll move on to the latest results. Uh, and then finally, I'll talk about the future, which is where you'll have to wrestle me off the stage so I don't eat into the coffee break. Um, okay, and uh, if, if you want to ask questions during the talk, I, I assume that's that's fine. Um, please just shout them out. Ryan. So the motivation for all this. So, so when I talk about 21 centimeter cosmology, I'm talking about the red shifted 21 centimeter emission line that comes from neutral hydrogen. So if you've got a load of neutral hydrogen somewhere, uh, it will just spontaneously emit a 21 centimeter photon every few million years. Uh, now, of course, you have lots of neutral hydrogen out there in space, and so you get an appreciable signal. Um, where is the neutral hydrogen? So um, at very high redshifts, most of the universe was filled with neutral hydrogen. Uh, sort of after recombination, the universe became neutral again, hydrogen being the, the biggest component of the, the baryonic component of the universe, lots of neutral hydrogen around. So if you <clears throat> you talk about what, what at that point we're pushing it, calling it the uh, intergalactic medium. There weren't any galaxies yet, but at those very high redshifts, all the, the gas that pervaded space, that, that would have been emitting quite a, a weak 21 centimeter signal. Um, you, you don't really get a, a sizable signal until after redshift 200. Um, and then it stays neutral for, for quite a while until you get to the time of cosmic dawn, uh, when the first stars and galaxies sort of switch on and start ionizing some of this gas. Um, then you get lots of interesting thermal physics going on. Um, you see interesting phenomenology in the 21 centimeter signal. Then eventually the whole universe is reionized. The IGM is 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 pretty much all, all ionized. And then the only H1 that's left in appreciable amounts is, is in these very dense clumps inside galaxies where it's shielded uh, from ionizing photons. It sort of shields itself. Um, now, the interesting thing about H1 at late times is um, it, it's also the fuel for, for star formation, it's an important part of a galaxy's life cycle. Um, but we can use it as cosmologists, essentially, to trace the large scale structure. If it's in galaxies, the galaxies trace the large scale structure, we can use the H1 to trace the galaxies. Okay, and then because of this um, large amount in the IGM at earlier times, we can also see that. And so in principle, we have this continuous tracer of the large scale structure of the universe in some state from redshift 200 to today. Um, you can't get that with any other tracer, pretty much. Um, if you think about things like optical galaxies, there's no optical galaxies above a redshift of 10 or so. Um, so what is intensity mapping? I've talked about 21 centimeter, the 21 centimeter line. What is intensity mapping? Uh, the usual mode of large scale structure cosmology is to go and observe individual galaxies, make gigantic catalogs, and then put those catalogs in, in a sort of 3D map generally, um, and then great, you, you, you have a beautiful tracer of the, the cosmic large scale structure. Um, that's very time consuming, especially if you want proper 3D information, you want spectroscopic information. Um, there are lots of very powerful machines out there now that can do lots of spectra in one go like DESI, uh, but it's still very time consuming and, and reasonably expensive. I think it's still about a dollar per galaxy spectra or something, uh, which you know, if you think you want a few hundred million of those is not that cheap. Um, and particularly at redshifts above two, say, um, you know, the, the, the sources are getting progressively harder to see, um, and it's, it's harder to make these maps out there. Um, and then, as I just mentioned, above redshift, I, I mean, this number changes all the time, but let's say above a redshift of about 10, people keep finding galaxies at higher redshifts. But, um, you know, above there, at some point, uh, you know, you get, you get to the very first galaxy. So you can't do galaxy surveys very effectively above 
I would say redshift six or so. It's just very hard, very hard to get high number densities, um, even even with the the best instrumentation in the world. So the idea with intensity mapping is cut out the middleman. Don't try and observe individual galaxies. Um, essentially, instead of trying to resolve them, um, you you sort of take your glasses off, make your eyes blurry, use a low angular resolution instrument like a radio telescope. And so instead of resolving the individual galaxies, you're collecting the photons from many, many, many individual galaxies uh, in each voxel uh, volume element in space. And by doing that, you, you, you essentially don't have to do any thresholding or anything like that to say, yes, I've detected a galaxy. No, I haven't. It might be a noise fluctuation. You, you see all the photons and then a bit like the CMB, you analyze the, the signal plus the noise all together. And in principle, this lets you have a significantly higher survey speed. So this is line intensity mapping. You don't have to use the 21 centimeter emission line. You can use any other reasonably narrow emission line. CO is a, a one that's becoming popular, for example. Um, but as I've just mentioned, 21 centimeters is nice because you can go to very high redshifts. Um, and so essentially, you, you, you recover a, a 3D map of the cosmological uh, density field directly. You're not looking at individual galaxies. You're looking at um, what, what are brightness temperature fluctuations in this emission line on very large scales. So obviously, because you're playing this trick of not resolving individual galaxies, there's a limited angular resolution. I'll talk about that a bit in a second. Um, but the spectral resolution can be very high. Radio telescopes tend to have very high spectral resolution. You sort of get spectra for free uh, by using a radio telescope. Um, and the main point of all this is you get a very fast survey speed, even at higher redshifts. So um, I'd probably say, you know, the, the battle has been won by optical and near infrared galaxy surveys at lower redshifts. They're very effective now and you get beautiful results from them. Uh, I, I don't think there's, there's any way of sort of catching up with intensity mapping uh, in, in, in the near future for, for the lowest redshifts. But at higher redshifts, it might be possible to do optical galaxy surveys, uh, particularly if you're sort of doing uh, something between spectroscopy and photometry. For redshift, but it, it's still very difficult. So I, I think that's probably the regime where intensity mapping is is the more natural approach. Um, so, what are some applications of twenty one centimeter surveys? So I mentioned you, it, it's a tracer of the 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 cosmic matter distribution essentially. So anything you can do uh, with a galaxy survey on large scales, a spectroscopic galaxy survey, uh, you can do with twenty one centimeter surveys essentially. So you want to detect the baryon acoustic oscillations or the redshift space distortions through clustering. You can do that with these things. There are some caveats I'll talk about in a second uh, when you come to analyze this, but you can do it. Um, also, uh, a very interesting application, and I think, is is because these things have such a high survey speed, you can cover a large volume of the universe in a short space of time. Um, you can potentially use it to do just gigantic surveys of ultra large scales. So, so by this, I mean uh, scales uh, below K of about 10 to the minus two inverse megaparsecs. So that's the, the matter radiation equality scale. Um, at scales larger than that, it, it, it's, it's hard to measure. You don't have many copies of that scale on the full sky um, at, at any redshift. But uh, there's some interesting general relativistic effects that come in. So there's some interesting corrections you can look for. Um, and things like a scale dependent bias due to local type non Gaussianity. So there's some interesting phenomenology there that we haven't really got to grips with yet because it's been so hard to measure those ultra large scales. That's somewhere where 21 centimeter intensity mapping might come into its own. Um, another interesting thing you can do with it is weak lensing. And, and so this isn't like weak lensing of, of galaxies. Uh, it's much more like weak lensing of the CMB. And essentially, instead of having the, the CMB as, as your sort of backlight and seeing how that gets lensed as the light travels through the universe. Um, you, you've got your 21 centimeter map at a specific redshift. You can try and measure that lensing effect. But of course, with the CMB, you just have one copy of the CMB. With 21 centimeter, you have all these spectroscopic slices. And so it's sort of like CMB lensing on steroids in a way. Um, and you, you have lots and lots of, of slices through, through the matter distribution that you can use uh, as your lens source. Um, Another interesting one, if you're more into the dark matter side of things, um, might be the, the H1 distribution. Um, where the H1 is in, in uh, dark matter halos, it actually extends to quite low halo masses. So we think around 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 solar masses is sort of around the limit of where H1 can survive from being bombarded by all the UV photons out there in the IGM. 
Um, so um, if you have, for example, an axion type dark matter model or something that uh, messes around with your uh, halo abundance uh, at, at low to intermediate halo masses, uh, you get observable um, effects on the H1 distribution. Um, again, I, I am actually skimming over like 30 papers on this that there's not space to cite, but if you're interested in that, come and talk to me. Um, and then I, I think, of course, there's uh, th this uniqueness of 21 centimeter as a way of probing reionization and the cosmic dawn. There are other molecular lines and things like that during reionization that you can hope to observe. And things like J JWST are seeing individual galaxies during this period. But if you want a very large scale view of, of, of the IGM and what's happening during cosmic dawn and reionization, 21 centimeter is pretty much the only game in town. Um, and then uh, the, the, the ultimate, uh, I think possibly the end point for cosmology, uh, I'm not sure if I'll be retired or dead by the time this happens, but who knows, um, is, is looking to the dark ages. So the dark ages, I mean, above redshifts of about 20, 30 or so, um, where the universe is just filled essentially with neutral hydrogen. That's a very good tracer of the linear matter density field. Not much nonlinear collapse has happened yet. Uh, and there's just tons and tons and tons of Fourier modes out there to measure. You can measure the linear density field and, you know, for example, improve your constraints on inflation and things like that. It's a bit futuristic. It's hard to access from Earth. The atmosphere starts becoming opaque or at least very wibbly uh, if you want to go to dark ages redshifts with this sort of technique. Um, but, you know, people, people are talking about it, potentially putting instruments on the moon, things like that. Um, so this plot here is, is just to show you, this is some, these are some forecasts we did a few years ago. Essentially, you've got, you've got redshift on, on, on the x-axis and, and on the y-axis, you've got the fractional uh, error, the Fisher forecast error uh, on, on the uh, Hubble, the expansion rate as a function of redshift for different instruments. The ones to draw your attention to are the dark blue line. Uh, that's a square kilometer array survey, um, sort of the, the biggest one you would hope to do. Um, in band one, the lower frequency band, so it can get to higher redshifts, up to a redshift of about three. And then just below that, you can see um, a sample variance limited galaxy survey, um, which, which is mildly based on Euclid, but not so much anymore. Um, and you can see that the cosmic, uh, the sample variance limited survey um, is obviously lower, but only by a factor of two or so. So with something like SK, the mid frequency array, you, you can get pretty close in principle uh, to the best you can do with a spectroscopic galaxy survey over the same redshift range. Um, okay, on to observational approaches. So rather than giving you a primer on radio astronomy and things like that, I'm going to assume you either know enough for me to not bore you about it or know little enough that you don't really care too much about all the, the nitty gritty of radio telescopes. It's fascinating. I love them. Um, you know, this is this precision machine uh, that goes out there and, you know, gets these photons from, you know, when the, the, the universe was less than a million years old, but you can bash it with a hammer and it's okay. Nothing breaks. Normally nothing breaks. Things break for spontaneous reasons instead. Um, so when you're building these things, um, you have to balance a load of different properties of the radio telescope. So an obvious one is sensitivity, um, sort of how, how, how sensitive do you, do you want the thing to be? And something that governs that is going to be its collecting area, uh, as well as the receiver electronics. Um, its resolution is an absolutely crucial one. Um, I'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, stability, which for 21 centimeter cosmology turns out to be the the paramount thing, the most important thing. How stable is your instrument? Do, do, do its uh, calibration parameters go drifting off after a few seconds? Uh, how often do you need to make a very, very, very accurate measurement of, of its uh, response to, to whatever is photons are coming in from the sky? Um, and then beyond that, just this little thing called cost, which we, we, we don't talk about in polite company, um, but I'll maybe mention it again. Um, you know, obviously, we'd love to put these things on the far side of the moon, but uh, no money for that just yet. So um, two essentially complementary approaches uh, to how you build your radio telescope. The, the classic one that's, that's sort of the, the modern one that, that most radio astronomers use and care about are interferometers. So you have multiple dishes and every pair of or dishes or receivers, every pair of those you can uh, essentially correlate. So multiply together the signals. From those things, you get interference fringes. Uh, you measure the amplitude of that called the visibility. Um, depending on how far apart your, your receivers are, you get a higher and higher angular resolution. Um, these things, because you're 
correlating lots of pairs of things. Uh, a lot of things correlate out uh, when you do that. So these things are more stable. So certain things that only affect one antenna, one receiver, um, those things correlate out. They go away, they average away, um, which, which means they're just inherently more stable. Um, in principle, that means they're easier to calibrate. In practice, they're not. Um, but a, 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 a very curious thing about these, if, if you've done any interferometry or tried to make images uh, from an in interferometer, is uh, they only measured certain Fourier modes on the sky, discrete Fourier modes. So if you want to recover the whole map of the whole sky, you can't do that. Um, you can only recover the Fourier mode that, that you have specific baselines, so pairs of antennas to be able to recover, um, which is interesting. If you're trying to map the universe, you've got to choose which Fourier mode you care about the most. And that's a really crucial optimization. Um, and I, I, somewhat cryptically, I've put more chromatic here. That means they, they just their response to the, the sky depends more on frequency. Um, so you have to be more careful calibrating them as a function of frequency. I'll talk about that in just a second as well. Uh, single dish telescopes, on the other hand, are exactly what they say they are. Rather than correlating pairs of receivers, you just have a single receiver that operates on its own. Um, they tend to be low resolution. The thing that sets their resolution is the, the size of the collecting element. Um, and they have a very time dependent response. So typically you want to use them a bit like you'd use a CMB um, experiment. You scan them across the sky very fast to build up a map. Um, that means there's lots of time dependencies in the system as well. You can even see, you know, these things are quite gigantic. I've, I've shown a picture in the bottom right there of um, one of the meerkat dishes in South Africa. That's 13.5 meters in diameter. And, and when you scan it across the sky and then stop to go the other way, it sort of wobbles a little bit because it's, you know, 13.5 meters of steel and then goes the other way. You know, these, these things are big. There are all these time dependent effects you have to be a bit careful about. Um, they have nicer spectral properties. They're less chromatic um, and it's easier to make maps. It's much more like the CMB case. Uh, and, and just to finish off this slide, if, if you see in the, the top right there, that's a, an aerial photo or possibly a satellite photo of the HERA array, the hydrogen epoch of reionization array, also on the same site, right next to Meerkat in South Africa. Um, and it's, it's recently been completed. And um, if there are any extraterrestrials looking at it, they might be worried that we're going to shoot lasers at them or something. But um, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a sort of close packed hexagonal array that's an interferometer. So it has lots and lots and lots of baselines, pairs of antennas that are the same length, the same distance apart. And so what's been optimized there is looking at particular Fourier modes again and again and again, rather than trying to get all the Fourier modes. That's an example of, of, of how you can um, try and balance certain requirements in terms of resolution and sensitivity. OK. Um, if you have a telescope like Meerkat that is you know, sort of single dish, Meerkat's actually 64 single dishes that are connected together and are usually used as an interferometer. Uh, you have this nice complementarity in the angular scales they can see. So along the x-axis here, you can see k perpendicular and angular Fourier scale. Uh, the y-axis, you've got redshift. Um, and if you use Meerkat as uh, 64 you know, independent single dishes, uh, you're predominantly seeing these lower k perp modes, um, so larger scales. Uh, and if, as an interferometer, the sort of interferometer take, takes off where, where you know, the single dish left it. Uh, and goes to these smaller angular scales. And um, so you have to choose. And what I've put here is just the BAO scale, the co-moving BAO. Um, so you can see at lower redshifts, you'd perhaps prefer to use single dish for something like Meerkat or the SKA. At higher redshifts, you'd prefer to use an interferometer. Um, yep. So what does the 21 centimeter signal have in it? We don't just measure the 21 centimeter field, unfortunately. That would be fantastic. And this would have all been done 50 years ago. What we actually see is the 21 centimeter that there's an average brightness temperature of this, this line um, and fluctuations around it. So there's a nice simulated plot here. Uh, black is the, the, the mean um, and the blue are the, the fluctuations along the line of sight due to cosmic structure. So it looks very noise-like, but if you, if you did a, a power spectrum of this, you'd see a, a nice normal um, you know, P of K type power spectrum. And uh, just pay attention to the y-axis scale. So, so here we're talking about milli millikelvin, perhaps below. Ob observe frequency here. So 1420 megahertz is, is redshift zero, for the 21 centimeter line. Um, so redshift zero there, going all the way down back to redshift six here. Um, 
the important thing here is to note this foreground contribution here. It varies across the sky. Most of our foregrounds are things like galactic synchrotron, uh, extragalactic uh, radio emission, um, which tends to be very, very spectrally smooth, almost power law or just a slightly curved power law. Um, but it, it, it can be three or even five orders of magnitude brighter than this 21 centimeter signal, um, which of course is gigantic. So you have to remove this gigantic thing um, and make sure you're just leaving behind this tiny thing. And then once you've done that, you can just analyze this like you'd analyze any other large scale structure data. Easy, right? I'll get onto that. Um, there's thermal noise on top of this as well. So depending on how long you observe for, your thermal noise will average down. Um, and then the, the real horror, horror stories with, with radio telescopes are all the different things that can go wrong. You've built this beautiful instrument that sees the sky and then there's just this simple uh, gain calibration parameter that maps um, you know what the, the voltages you see to to the the actual brightness temperature you're trying to measure and it's not simple at all and it's horrible and you get all these effects like uh, po polarization leakage um, these things have a, an angular response on the sky that isn't just a simple delta function it's some some sort of diffraction pattern type thing with side lobes and the, the side lobes vary as a function of frequency um, and then this signal uh, sorry, th this signal, both of these get modulated by that spectrally varying thing, uh, which means this nice smooth power law here gets chopped up uh, in, into some some much more spectrally varying thing. And, and so how do you deal with that? Um, similar effects due to just getting your calibration a bit wrong for various reasons. Uh, and a big one is uh, human generated radio frequency interference, things like FM radio, uh, global positioning satellites, things like that take out big chunks of the frequencies we care about. Um, and you can barely even run from this anymore because of things like global positioning. Uh, there's always a satellite in the sky uh, there to ruin your day or get you to the conference. It's kind of useful as well, I suppose. Um, so I'll talk a bit more about foreground contamination because it's such a big thing. But again, you know, this is, this is a big subject that people have spent many, many hours on and uh, I'm not gonna do it justice in one slide. So um, just back to this idea of the foregrounds being intrinsically smooth in frequency, they look like power laws mostly. Um, if you take a Fourier transform of that and you know squint your eyes a little bit, uh, you can see that you, you're going to restrict the power in those foregrounds to low K parallel modes, so uh, the, the lowest radial K modes. Um, but then, as I mentioned, things like your, your beam, your, your angular response function, um, have these side lobes, lots of angular structure that also depends on frequency. It modulates that smoothness and then scatters that nice smooth low k parallel signal up to higher k parallel. Um, now, the annoying thing is it, it it doesn't just do that in a uniform way. Um, it also depends on which for an interferometer which baselines you're looking at. So longer baselines, which are the ones that give you your higher k perpendicular modes, um, your higher angular resolution ones. They're more chromatic. They they have more frequency modulation, uh, and so they scatter these foregrounds up to higher values of k parallel. And that's what you can see in this plot here. So that's baseline length or k, uh, essentially uh, k parallel, uh, k perpendicular. Sorry, on the x-axis, and then uh, tau, which is delay, or just let's call it k k parallel here on the y-axis. Um, for a few different geometry is a few different ways of building a radio telescope antenna. Uh, and you can see here, they all have this nice bright stripe here, which is just the intrinsic foregrounds at, at, at low uh, K parallel. But then as, as you go to longer baseline lengths, you get this wedge shape. This is the foreground wedge. Uh, and so th there's a geometric limit to how far out the wedge can go. But you see that, that they, you know, for, for certain things like a dipole antenna, the foregrounds get scattered from here all across this wedge, you're losing a big chunk of this two-dimensional Fourier space due to foregrounds being modulated and scattered out of where they should be living by this instrumental uh, effect. Now, if you're very careful about how you build your radio antenna and, and choose its geometry nicely and try and make those side lobes less chromatic and smaller and things like that, say with a phased array, you can make some of it go away. And with a dish, which is very popular at the minute, you can mostly make it go away. You see there's still a sort of lighter blue haze there where you're seeing some of that, but um, essentially you don't have to lose this entire wedge region. 
conservatively, you might want to chop the whole thing out. But you know, in, in principle, there's hope for accessing Fourier modes inside here as well. Okay. And then I'll very briefly talk about other systematics. Um, so here's a little diagram of some of the Hera dishes and uh, different signal paths. So, so the only signal path we want is say we've got a uh, dish one and dish two. The signal from dish one goes into this thing, this shipping container that's got our correlator in, the thing that multiplies the signals. Uh, so does dish two. We want the signals to go in there, get correlated together, spit them out in a computer somewhere and analyze them. That's the only signal path we want. Unfortunately, radio waves are very slippery and you get all sorts of different signal paths. So, so you can get over the air transmission. So as, as the sort of radio waves hit uh, dish number one, it excites a current in dish number one. That current also re-emits some radio waves that are received at uh, antenna number two. That's annoying. Uh, we call that uh, mutual coupling. Um, some, something that happened uh, with a recent season of Hera data was, was we had a signal going into this thing, and then there was a small gap in the shipping container, which um, instead of the, the container being a nice Faraday uh, box, essentially, you had a tiny slot in the side of it that wasn't fully sealed. Well, that's, that's a pretty good slot antenna. And then it was re-emitting the signals that were received that were being then received by other elements of the array. And then going back down the cables again and all getting correlated together. You can see this could be a terrible mess if you're not careful. These effects are normally small, but not negligible. Um, a fun thing you can do is, is try and figure out what the different time delays are between signals that should go down the cables, the ones you care about, that signal path, and ones that are getting transmitted across the air or go, going into the container back out again and things like that. And what you can do is essentially take, take your data, which if you have bad systematics, looks like this. This is a frequency versus time plot for one baseline. It looks horrible. You're not supposed to see all that wiggly structure. Um, and then you can essentially Fourier transform in the frequency and the time axis. This is something called delay. This is something called fringe rate. And you can see that uh, a lot of these systematics are quite localized in that space because of this time delay argument. Um, and, and so here, what, what you can imagine doing this is this is the sky, you, you expect to see that, but then you've got these little dots and lines here that you can maybe filter out. Um, right, on to some actual data now. So um, most of 21 centimeter cosmology at high redshifts is, is currently an upper limits game. We don't have a definitive detection of the signal. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you how far away we are on this slide. Um, so HERA is sort of the, the latest generation experiment, the last one before the square kilometer array switches on doing this sort of thing. Um, and as, as I've already mentioned, it's this sort of hexagonal array with many baselines that are the same length to build up sensitivity uh, on certain Fourier modes. And uh, we've been running this thing for a few years now. We tend to run it in seasons. Uh, the latest season we've analyzed uh, fully is was about 94 nights uh, in 2017 to 2018 using an older configuration with fewer antennas. Um, we have data from the last two years, even this year, that we're currently analyzing. We're just not ready to put the results out yet. Um, but this is the most recent one that there are results made public for. Um, and essentially, if, if you look at, uh, we, we call this the dimensionless power spectrum, but it's not dimensionless in this field. It's actually in units of millikelvin squared, which which annoys me, but I can't think of a better name for it. Um, it's essentially what the, the it's P of K over KQ times the these units. But anyway, uh, the important thing that matters is these are some, um, this is a function of redshift. We're actually mixing different Fourier scales. These are measurements at different K, um, not represented on this plot. These are uh, theoretical predictions for where you would expect this, this 21 centimeter signal to be. Uh, you can see it's around a you know, few millik level, uh, level, so about 10 millik squared in power. These are all the measurements of experiments that have gone before. And these two are the most recent HERA ones. So you can see we're just about, depending on uh, how optimistic you are about the theoretical predictions, we're about two orders of magnitude away from what we would hope would be a detection. So that might seem quite far, but just in the last few years, we've sort of gone from these measurements here to this measurement here. We're, we are doing an order of magnitude, uh, an order of magnitude or two every decade. So now HERA is fully built out. We have the new data. We have new receivers and stuff as well. We're hoping to do slightly better than that. In principle, we have the sensitivity now. Um, if we do one more observing season to detect this, 
course, things don't normally work out that way. There'll be lots of problems to solve as well. But we're, we're getting close. Um, why on earth should you be interested in upper limits that are two orders of magnitude away from the actual signal? What scientific value do those have, apart from keeping me employed? Um, and the, I, I think it, it's not as exciting as it would be if we did have a detection. There's tons of stuff we could do. We could learn all sorts of things about um, early galaxy formation. We could learn, well, there's lots of dark matter models, for example, that we can constrain using this. The, these, this, the 21 centimeter field is essentially quite sensitive to any energy injection from, say, uh, particle decays. But we can't do that yet. What we can do is look at these upper limits and uh, test their consistency with other signals that other people see uh, and, and see if uh, that rules out any of the models. Um, so, so an interesting one is a cold reionization model. This is when there's not much heating of the intergalactic medium during reionization. Um, that will give you a really large 21 centimeter signal. We pretty much rule that out now. Some caveat supply. Um, if uh, high mass X-ray binaries are the main heating source, uh, we can also point out that because we don't see a large signal, um, the ones we see they must be low metallicity ones, essentially. So you know, if 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 you're a large scale structure cosmologist, this probably doesn't sound that interesting to you. But if you're a galaxy formation person, it might be a bit more up your street. Um, and a slightly weird one that I quite like is radio backgrounds. So. There are all these results floating out there that people aren't really sure how seriously to take them. A, 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 a well-known one is the Arcade 2 excess. Uh, there's all, also an excess emission seen by the uh, LWA, the Long Wavelength Array. Um, they see this excess radio emission, this radio background. We don't really know where it comes from. We don't even know what redshift it comes from. We don't even actually know if it's real or if it's just an instrumental effect. Uh, so people come up with models of this. And actually with the HERA data in uh, in combination with some Chandra X-ray data, you can actually say, well, look, if, if you expect to get the, the signal of the same size of the Arcade 2 or, or the LWA signal, it can't come from above Redshift 8. Because if it did, we would have already detected the 21 centimeter power spectrum, because those extra uh, radio background photons would have interacted with uh, the neutral hydrogen field, and we would have seen a big uh, absorption signal, essentially. And then you can see here that, that uh, you know, combining those, those data, we actually chop out a big a big part of this this parameter space in in the the fraction of x-ray and radio photons um so i'll just briefly skim over the single dish approach i've been talking about interferometers for a bit uh, this was sort of pioneered for 21 centimeter by by the green bank telescope they got a first cross correlation detection um with with um uh, deep two i think a galaxy survey um and I've already mentioned these things are less chromatic than interferometers. So they don't have such horrible foreground problems, although they still have quite bad foreground problems. But they have gain drifts that uh, gains that drift over time, so you have to calibrate them very, very frequently. And they have limited angular resolution. Uh, so I'll give you an example of how that affects something like recovering the baryon acoustic oscillations. So if you take something like the SKA um, at, at a redshift of about 0.5, it would have an angular resolution of only about one degree. Um, if you're using it in single dish mode, which is, is, you know, gigantic compared to the size of your average galaxy on the sky, a couple of arc seconds or so. Um, what this does is if, if you convert all the angles, do all the maths, um, you see that the BAO feature gets broadened by this. So, so this is some work by a student of mine, Fraser Kennedy. Uh, you can see th these are just uh, correlation functions. You, you've got a monopole and quadrupole uh, in each column. And uh, just focus on the top one. You see, as, as you increase the smoothing scale, so essentially as you go to higher redshift, uh, the angular size of your beam gets bigger uh, compared to the co-moving scale. Uh, you go from having a nice, well-defined BAO bump where you expect it to something that smooths out quite a lot. Um, in the radial direction, you don't get this effect. This is just the transverse BAO. So you can still recover the BAO quite well up to high redshift, but you obviously take a hit due to this finite resolution. Uh, and then uh, here is what happens if you remove the foreground contaminated modes and don't try and uh, recover the, the signal in that region either. And you see you also get uh, a weird, um, you, the continuum changes of your, your uh, BAO, your correlation function. Uh, you can still recover the scale. You just have to be more careful about measuring it. Uh, we do have a detection at low redshifts, though. Um, so, as I mentioned, GBT had one, a few other telescopes have detections as well. They're all in cross-correlation with a galaxy survey. 
Uh, the main reason being if you cross correlate with a galaxy survey, a lot of systematic effects get correlated out. Uh, that's where we are with this stuff at the minute. But uh, we have this very nice uh, clear detection in cross correlation from Meerkat now. Uh, why is this important? It's because Meerkat is a very direct precursor to the SKA. If we can do this with Meerkat, we know we can do it with SKA, but with uh, much smaller error bars. So we've sort of proved that this works, uh, thanks in no small part to, to Meerkat having a just absolutely fantastic instrument, uh, instrumental design. Uh, it's a beautiful instrument. Um, and so just to give you some numbers, this is a, uh, about 10.5 hours of data times 64 uh, Meerkat dishes. We get a 7.7 .7 sigma cross correlation detection with wiggles. Um, there are some analysis aspects to this to be aware of. Uh, because you're doing full ground removal, you lose some signal, you lose some power due to that as well. You have to replace it. So we have to use a transfer function approach to do that. And um, it's so nasty, uh, some of the systematics that we actually have to use uh, 30 modes worth of subtraction of the full grounds, which is quite large. Um, I'll briefly mention a few other experiments as well. So Chime is, is a really big one, a nice design, but they found it very hard going analyzing their data because of various effects that I won't go into too much. But essentially this is um, uh, K, uh, K, well, K parallel, K perpendicular here. These are the BAO scales, and these are the regions they can see at the minute with their analysis. They can't see the BAO yet, which is what they were designed to detect uh, due to these systematic issues, but they can detect the cross correlation signal. Uh, and then briefly, I should mention 21 centimeter global signal experiments like edges as well, where they try and detect the, the average signal across space. Um, they see an anomalous absorption feature that other experiments like SARS-3 don't. And that's a, that's a whole story in itself. So in the hopefully couple of minutes or so, one, can, we, can we haggle? Can I do? <laughs> uh, I'll keep talking until he drags me off the stage. OK, deal. Um, I, I just want to talk about the future of these things a little bit. So where are all the intensity maps? We've been working on this stuff for you know, a couple of decades now almost. Um, why hasn't it turned into this sort of very productive cosmology machine like galaxy surveys have? And I hope through some of the things I've just been mentioning, you can see some of the analysis difficulties, this tremendous dynamic range between the foregrounds and the signal, and the way that those foregrounds are modulated by subtle systematic effects. It's just very hard to model. Uh, and you know, eventually we will be able to model at that accuracy. It's just hard going. Um, I think an another issue is uh, we we we've been learning on the job uh, as we've been building these arrays. Um, so the first generation of arrays, people essentially just used telescopes that already existed or were designed for other purposes, applied for time on them, or you know, try tried to do their best with those. That's fine. That's a good place to start. Uh, afterwards, uh, people discovered that wasn't quite good enough. We needed to do better. So they built uh, purpose-designed arrays with very high sensitivity, so lots of receivers. And, um, that helped, but uh, there were lots of problems. We're now probably on what, what I call the third generation. So these are purpose-built arrays that aren't just there for sensitivity. They also have various systematic effect mitigating features as well. So HERA's particular design, this hexagonal layout is part of that. Um, Going on, I, I think the, the next thing everyone's anticipating is the SKA, uh, which is sort of this strange, because it, it's been designed on a 20-year timescale, is this weird uh, mishmash of first, second, and third generation ideas all together. Um, people are just doing refinements of the third generation at the minute otherwise. And then the fifth generation, or what I would call it, is going to the moon, uh, which I've, I've mentioned might be possible on our lifetimes. Let's see. Um, I have a modest proposal for an alternative fourth generation. It's not really modest. It just, I, I mean, I want more money. Uh, I think that's what would, would cure a lot of problems with these things. So, so, and that's to use a space mission type approach. So we're building these things and trying to squeeze it into relatively low budgets of a few million, a few tens of million, uh, tens of millions of, of dollars for the uh, purpose built things. It's not really enough to do the full sort of very careful design life cycle type approach that you would do with a space mission like like Euclid or Planck. Um, if you think about things like Planck, uh, the amount of effort that just went into simulating the, the focal plane or things like that was gigantic. It was lots of uh, time and people. Uh, we don't have anything like that. In, in a typical experiment like this, you might have one or two people uh, trying to simulate the array. 
um, and then they graduate and then you're stuck with those simulations for a few years. The resources aren't there to do this as a full and proper job. Um, so what would an over-engineered 21 centimeter experiment that's built on space mission principles look like? I've just put all of these up here. Don't look at them all, I'll highlight some. I think horn antennas are probably uh, the most controlled receiver type we could be using. They're more expensive, but you can control them well. We should have more dedicated calibration hardware instead of just trying to do our best in software. Someone needs to build a very high fidelity sky model, and that's that's difficult long-term work that needs funding, and a very careful treatment of, of, of the sky, I think, is, is what needs to uh, be added into that. So, so, so in the 10 minutes I have, uh, <laughs> I have left, uh, I'm just going to mention a few solutions that myself and some of my collaborators are working on with this. And I'm going to mention them very briefly uh, to keep to time. Uh, and the, the idea here is you come and talk to me about these things if you're interested. I'm, I'm not going to try and convey it all right now. One is Hydra. I'm very excited about this. We built this Bayesian pipeline that can model the entire array and sky with around a million parameters if you let it. Um, and actually sample in a statistical manner, like a Monte Carlo sampler, all of those parameters in a tractable amount of time. What does tractable mean? I can get samples for uh, as something like error uh, in you know under an hour, certainly in tens of minutes, perhaps. So this this uses the magic of Gib sampling, which some of you in the CMB community will be familiar with. Uh, I won't go into the details, but but the nice thing is we can do a full Bayesian approach to this now. We don't have to make approximations and 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 sort of uh, worry about calibration errors to the same extent. We have a, a this this nice Bayesian approach, and just uh, just advertise some work that's in prep from uh, Jacob Berber, who's a postdoc in my group. Um, he's done this for power spectrum recovery. The code is out there, paper soon. And Katrine Glasscock, who is a PhD student in my group, working on diffuse full ground recovery. Um, again, I can't go into details right now because of time, but come and chat to me about it if you're interested. Um, one thing I'll mention very briefly, but uh, might be of general applicability to a lot of uh, ob observers, is something that uh, Mike Kwilensky, who's also a postdoc in my group, has been working on. He has this uh, method called Kyborg, which it, it does automated Bayesian jackknife tests. Um, so we have so much data now. Eyeballing all of it, doing jackknives, splitting the data, looking for problems is very onerous. Uh, Kyborg does it in an automated way, and it gives you this nice dashboard that shows up when a particular subset of the data is 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 causing you problems. Again, come and chat to me if you're interested. Uh, we think it's certainly going to be useful for the CMB. Uh, and then the last one, which is sort of my midlife crisis project, um, I'm ready for it though, is um, a giant horn antenna called Rhino for 21 centimeter global signal observations. As I mentioned, horn antennas. Uh, give you really good control over systematic properties of your beam. Uh, I want to build one. Uh, the sad thing is, so, so the wavelengths you care about, it's about four meter wavelengths. You need at least three wavelengths for these things. So I, I somehow need to build a sort of 15, 16 meter tall horn somewhere that will let me do it. So uh, this is Hugh Garsden, who's a postdoc in my group with, with a wooden prototype that we're building uh, at Jodrell Bank there. Hugh looks very happy, but um, it's heavy. And I'm going to end there. So thanks very much for your attention. Um, just to summarize, 21 centimeter surveys are difficult. We've made a lot of progress, but they're still difficult. Um, we will be able to do very interesting things with them soon, I hope. And we can already do some useful science. Uh, we have to figure out how to do them if we want to access the dark ages. If you want cosmology to have a long-term future, probably dark ages is where it's at. So we've got to make it work eventually. Um, and to do this, I, I think probably the, 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 the good money goes on a space mission style approach where we're very careful about all aspects of the engineering and design. Uh, in the meantime, I'd suggest keep a close eye on Meerkat because I, I think we're, we're getting large amounts of new data um, and hopefully we'll be able to get some interesting detections of things soon. Great. Thanks very much for your attention. Mm. Thank you, Phil, for so, being right on time. So, so, sorry, I'm I was kidding, obviously. So, so he's all of his uh, question time. No, I'm kidding. Again, uh, we still have time for a few questions. So,
Thanks very much. Uh, very nice talk. So I'm doing low frost stuff and a few 21 centimeter. So uh, I'm basically doing BAO and I, I saw the cross correlation of meerkat between uh, with Wiggles 8. And I was wondering why uh, can we detect BAO signals from cross correlation here and why not just calculate the correlation fun function instead? Because in your previous slide, you show some uh, foreground removal affects the uh, correlation function. So, yeah. Yep. So, so um, I I think so. So you you could try both. You could try and detect or measure the correlation function and the the this the 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 power spectrum. The problem is that the correlation function is a bit more fiddly with this transfer function approach. So because we're removing the foregrounds, um, if things were very simple, you just see the continuum. Um, well, I'll go back to that slide. Uh, uh, you see on the bottom here, you just see the the continuum of your correlation function start to go a bit weird and drift away. I I think it's still a bit too noisy to even have a sort of well defined continuum like that. Um, I, we we don't detect the BAO yet in cross correlation, for example. I mean, this is so, for auto correlation or cross correlation in this book. You could you could do this is auto correlation here, but you could do a cross correlation version. Like cross That's correlation. Because. I assume the foreground removal is like systematics can be cancelled out. Can you, um, some systematics cancel out, but if your foregrounds are large, so, so if you didn't remove foregrounds at all, um, you could they would mostly cross correlate out, but the variance on your measurement would be very large. They they would have, so the mean would be zero, but they contribute to your variance. So you have to remove some foregrounds, and as soon as you start removing some foregrounds, you remove some signal, so you get signal loss. So you have to correct for that signal loss. And we, we've found that um, in Fourier space, we can do a good job of that. So Steve Cunnington has a nice paper out this year on uh, how to do transfer functions properly uh, to, to get the signal back out in an unbiased way. Uh, for a correlation function, we, we haven't really tried it yet. And I'd be a bit worried about um, whether we can re recover stuff in a, an unbiased way. Uh, There's an interesting thing to try. OK, thank you, thank you very much. Thanks. I'm just surprised no one wants to shout at me for sort of advocating spending more money on 21 centimeter cosmology. Yeah, the tension's killing me. Um, so I'm going to bite on the thing that you said about money. Um, where do you get the money for a space mission type experiment that's not in space when SKA also already exists? So it's, it's a good question. I think SKA probably, this is my, my opinion, um, overpromised on the science it would be able to do, um, given that there have been subsequent cuts in scope of it. So if SKA was built as it was originally envisaged of an actual square kilometer of detecting area, I, I wouldn't be saying that, but to keep it within costs, it, it's it's not going to be a gigantic cosmology machine as, as we'd hope. We still hope to do a pretty big cosmology survey with this that would be competitive with things like Euclid, but it's going to come a few years after Euclid. So, you know, define what you mean by competitive now. Um, on the other hand, I, I think a lot of funding agencies do see that there is this pathway to things like the Dark Ages where there's you know, that, that's where the future will eventually be. And as we've seen with things like gravitational wave detections, there are funding agencies out there who are willing to, you know, take the long road and eventually get to a place. Now, it's up to us to make that case successfully. Uh, an interesting thing that's happening at the minute, uh, for some, some definition of interesting, is there's a new space race, right? So uh, you might have seen just in the last couple of weeks, two countries have tried to put landers on the moon. One worked, India's, uh, the Russian one didn't. Uh, others are trying to put landers on the moon. NASA is supposed to be sending astronauts there in 18 months. Um, you know, there's a big space race to get back to the moon. Um, and that might work to our advantage because governments are willing to spend obscene amounts of money to compete with other governments on, on things they think are within their national interest. And uh, the, 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 the job of a scientist is to try and divert a small sliver of those funds 
uh, to our own purposes um, and keep them away from the military guys for a bit. And and so I, I think there's a good potential that there might be some more funding in from the space sector to do space stuff. But for stuff on the the on the ground, it's the usual funding agencies. Whether we can make a case to those, and let's see. Hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, can you comment a bit more on the idea of doing this? Uh, observatory on the moon. What do you, what do you think about it? Uh, viability or whether it's something we could think of doing in several decades or or what? Um, yeah, it's a good question. So I I know some people in the community are very excited about it. Uh, there was this conference earlier in the year, uh, the Royal Society that Joe Silk and some other people organized, um, and it. <laughs> It's one of those things. Is is it technically feasible right now to build a radio telescope on the moon? Yes. One question is, would it be good enough? And another question is, would it be good value for money? Uh, and I, I think those are the things where the ideas are lacking at the minute. So, so just to give you a sort of sense of the cost of these things, at the moment with current launch technology, it costs about a million dollars to put one kilogram of equipment on the moon. Okay, so radio telescopes are very big and heavy. <laughs> And so, you know, you're talking several billion dollars with current technology. People are waiting for new launch systems and things like that to come online that might do this more cheaply. And people are coming up with ways like inflatable antennas that might be more lightweight and easier to deploy. Um, but there's so many ifs there. So do we know that an inflatable antenna will survive micrometeorite impacts? Um, the lunar regolith I recently learned is charged, which isn't great. If uh, you know you don't want a load of charged particles hanging around the base of sets of electronic equipment, uh, you know there's all these challenges, and so, so I think if you're very very optimistic, um, we, we could definitely have you know a functioning array of radio telescopes on the moon within ten years. But is that good enough to do the sort of primary science you're trying to do? It, it, does it solve all the systematic effects that you're going to have to deal with? Probably not. I. I I my my money is on 2060. Um, ask me again then. We'll see if I'm wrong or dead or something. I don't know. But um, yeah, it, it's. I I think it's something we should develop. But I'm I'm not going to spend all my time on it yet. Hey, I thought there are also proposals not to have a telescope on the moon, but something that's orbiting the moon that should be much much cheaper. Could you comment on that? Yeah, sure. So um, the, the, there have been a few proposals for sort of orbital interferometers for a while. I think uh, there was, I, I mean, a few decades ago, I think, uh, a, a Russian one that flew. Um, it's difficult to do. Um, you've got your baseline configuration, all your different antennas constantly moving around and changing the distance between them. So there's some sort of mild technological aspect to that in terms of like how, how do you correlate everything and how do you beam all the signals between them and stuff like that. I think that's all stuff you can solve. Um, I, I suppose one of the bigger issues is, it, does it get you that much more than you would have on the ground? So if you want to go to very, very low frequencies, you can't do certain stuff. Uh, I mean, below 10 megahertz, say. You can't do stuff from the ground because the atmosphere becomes opaque again. So if you want to do 10 megahertz stuff, then you have to go to space anyway. So I think maybe it makes sense there. But for this higher frequency stuff, um, I don't know, it, it, it seems complicated and still more expensive than the ground-based option, but you're still going to see the stuff you're trying to get away from, which is all the radio interference from Earth. It's really striking when people have sent uh, radio receivers around the far side of the moon and back, you see it just switch off. You, you see everything um, as, as you approach the moon, and then as you go around the back of the moon, it's deadly radio quiet. Um, there's only that very special place directly in the shadow, like the far side of the moon, that's so radio quiet. Otherwise, you, your problems are quite similar to your radio interference problems on Earth. So it depends on your motivation. If you want to go below a few megahertz, you've got to go to space. Um, and it, it, it is more cost effective than the moon, you're right. But otherwise, the ground is probably going to be cheaper and easier. Hi, Phil. So uh, my question is mostly asked already in these last two, but let me just refine. So if you need to go to low frequencies, dark ages, then of course you need to go to space because of interference. But as you said, you need three, four generations on the ground you know, to understand the systematics. So you 
maybe you need three generations of the moon to understand <laughs> the So my question is, how ready do you think after all this we learned the last decade that uh, you know that we know the design that we need to put that we will achieve the other problems, right? This, the, the interference is fine, but everything else, I guess, will be there or not. What what uh, what else do you get rid of by going to the moon? I I I think so. A lot of the a lot of the main technical issues of going to the moon aren't aren't so much in you know how you design the antennas and stuff like that. It's it's really prosaic stuff like how do you power the thing? And when you talk to people who've got concepts for arrays on the moon, it's like, oh yeah, interesting, it sounds interesting. And then how are you going to power it? And like, oh, we just need uh, 10 thermal radio thermal generators or like mini nuclear power plants on the moon or something. And it's like, oh, okay, that's starting to sound uh difficult. I I I think how how ready it it, it depends on which bit of the beast. You mean so in in terms of things like antennas analysis methods stuff like that the ones that we use on earth are pretty good precursors for anything we put on the moon um and so i, th I think we're probably not far away if you did a proper detailed design study like a space agency would do i, I think we'd be okay but for the other stuff around it very practical things like I mean, one is you land these things on the moon. You don't land them in one go because they're too big. How do you deploy them? Do you need astronauts? Do you need little robots? When you land them on the moon, you kick up loads of dust that can cover solar panels and stuff like that. There's all those sort of weird um, practical issues like that that seem more scary to me uh, than than the radio instrumentation side. Does that sort of answer your question? Um, so, so yeah, I'm just saying I, I I don't know about the engineering side enough. To say, but on the on the more sort of radio astronomy side, I think we're not far away. That's something you could definitely do in ten years, I think. Hello, thank you for the talk. Um, I'm su I was surprised to hear that you mentioned doing weak lensing with line intensity mapping, uh, and you compared it to the CMB. But the whole point of the CMB is that I really know what the CMB looks like. So, can you comment a bit on that on how you would do it with twenty one centimeter? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. So, um. I guess it, it's it's this is where it would be useful to cite a few papers because some people have done some nice work on this and and there's even people in the room I think who've, who've done more on this. It, it, it's so the idea is um, you essentially need to have some some basic knowledge of of your uh, intensity map in a in a very narrow redshift slice. So you want a map of it essentially. You can't just try and detect the power spectrum. You need the phases. You need an actual map. Um, much like you would with the CMB, you then try and delens. And in, in doing that delensing, you, you learn something about the lensing signal. Um, I don't know actually um, what what the sort of most promising method for doing that with 21 centimeter in the presence of foregrounds and stuff would be. But like I said, there are some papers out there in the literature that I, I think will uh, go over that. So uh, Ben Metcalf, uh, Alkistis Portidou, uh, and a few other people, I'm sorry if I missed your name out, uh, have written some nice papers on this that I think are worth looking at. But Methods wise, it, it's quite similar to the CMB, except in these narrow slices of, of um, intensity map as a function of redshift. And obviously, the higher redshift you go to, the, the stronger your lensing signal is expected to be. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. So, uh, you mentioned there are some sources of interference from like GPS satellites and so on, but how bad is the interference from Starlink? Because and also what happens in the future? Because Elon Musk said that recently he wants to put like forty thousand satellites in the next five years. So are you worried about that? I'm worried about Elon Musk in general, but uh, <laughs> that might be a slightly different question. So, so um, for the frequencies we're at, the Starlink satellites. So, so, so radio telescopes are really sensitive. Um, we see things like if if an aeroplane flies over nearby, we see reflected FM radio in Hera. You receive the, you know, you can tune in for a couple of seconds or something. It, it's or or um, wind turbines on the horizon. We see this in and out signal. It, 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 it's these things are ridiculously sensitive. So for Starlink, the frequencies it operates at are in the sort of few gigahertz, tens of gigahertz sort of range, which is quite bad for people more on the microwave end of the spectrum. Um, people doing certain molecular line stuff. It, it's very bad for them because it's directly in some of their bands. The thing that's most annoying for us are probably two things. One is reflections from the satellites, um, which are relatively minor, but if there's 40,000 of them up there, maybe it would be more of an issue. Uh, and very annoyingly, so 
people design these high tech spacecraft, these satellites, right? You think they're all precision engineered, and they have to put some sort of, uh, you know, electromagnetic shielding around them because there are certain um, industrial standards for that. But it's nowhere near good enough to prevent us from seeing noise from their electronics. So we can actually see noise from their electronics. You remember when you used to put like your, your mobile phone next to a speaker and it go doo -doo -doo -doo, when, when the message was being received. We see that, um, which isn't good. We see that in their sort of 100 megahertz range. I think LOFAR has seen it. Um, so that might become increasingly annoying. But the, the, the most annoying are global positioning satellites uh, and um, orbital communications for us at the minute. Um, yeah. Great, thanks a lot, Phil. That was really nice. Uh, thanks very let's, much. Let's give a round of applause. I have noticed that some people are sitting on the stairs. I'm afraid that's against uh, security measures. Do you mind just moving forward and sitting? There's plenty of space here. We're going for coffee now. Unfortunately, Isabel's uh, flight canceled. So we go for coffee, just catching up with our delay. So fortunately, we'll go back to normal. And the, uh, the second round of uh, plenary sessions will be at 11. Sorry, 11.30, you said? No. Sorry, just a moment. 11.30. Yes, of course, 11.30. Thank you all. You have a um, pen drive? I have a pen drive. Ah, okay, okay. Yes. Where I can send the link to some sort right. of email or something. Yes, we were hoping you would send the email, but it's <laughs> you can send this message if you want it. Please send your email. <laughs> through email your contact. Oh, okay. No, 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 it's okay. You can do it through email. Okay. So. Hey, uh, we need to find who is the next speaker. Uh, Gabriel is uh, yeah, they to, to have it ready for uh, the next. So Gabriel, do you have the slides? Can you stop sharing this, maybe, please? Um, right. Uh, who's next, Claire? Uh, Gabriel oh. Zahari. So on the Google Drive, we have Claire. Can you access the Google Drive from here? Mm, no. Can you send the Why link not? to the Gmail? It's on uh, Slack. Do you have it? Well, we don't have Slack in this machine. This is like some random machine. Okay. Laptop. Where do you want me to send it? Um, I mean, not to access from here. Where do you want me to send well, it? Well, we, we, we have the Gmail here. So I just go drive right here. Oh, yes. Can you send through the, can you send the slides to the mail? No, no problem. Uh -huh. <laughs>
Sí. Es que no he visto. Da igual. Pero ahora la, la próxima. Sí. La próxima. Oh, this one is okay, right? Yeah, oh, this one is okay. Number two. This one is okay. Yeah, this is better. Um, yeah, this is better. Great. So I move it back and forth. Mm -hmm. Is it turned on? Mm -hmm. Should be on. Oh, no, no. Just a moment. Yes. Okay. Right. Just a moment. Let's see that it works. Try it. Okay. Ah, oh, yes. Yes. You guys works. hear me? Yes. Perfect. Welcome back. Please, all of those in the back, just come over. There are plenty of seats here. We could fill up the room. Actually, today, probably we will be still a few seats left. As the week progresses, most likely, there'll be a day in which it will be completely full. So be aware not to stay on the stairs. That goes for you. Also, there are two large, well, not too large, two pages on the back where you can follow the, uh, the Wi-Fi passwords. They're also on the other rooms, blue, the red, the yellow, sorry, um, orange. So you can also see it from there. All right, if you're all ready, let's go for the second uh, plenary sessions. We have with us Gabriela Zaharias. We, she'll tell us about highlights from high energy astro, gamma and cosmic rays. And we have uh, 35 minutes and I'll tell you at the 10 minutes. Okay, mark. perfect. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, so let's get started. Um, uh, so organizers asked me to cover this rather wide topic uh, to basically present some highlights uh, from high energy astrophysics focusing on gamma and cosmic rays and then how we actually look for dark matter in the gamma and cosmic rays data. So, so let's get going. Um, I will not just dwell any and it's anymore on this slide, uh, I mean, on the content, on the idea that dark matter is present in the universe in the Cosmo 23 uh, workshop. Uh, just wanted to underline that all evidence for dark matter uh, we have so far is gravitational uh, and in astrophysical objects. And so then we are left with many questions. We know dark matter is there, but then we have all this question, is it a particle? Uh, if so, why it is stable? It seems, uh, does it and how it couples to standard model? Is it composite or elementary? Is there a dark sector? And many, many questions um, uh, that we want to address and for which we would need uh, sort of to probe non-gravitational couplings of dark matter. So a few words about indirect searches in general. So indirect searches are basically uh, this idea that one can look uh, through astrophysical data and then try to determine in smart ways uh, the dark matter nature. Basically, as I said, non-gravitational couplings or its mass, something that can tell us more, uh, more about dark matter. So pro of indirect searches is, of course, we are looking in places where we know dark matter resides uh, via gravity. Uh, and also often uh, we have we can have a benefit that astrophysical um, sources are nature's accelerators. So sometimes we can use this huge energy energy releases in astrophysical sources to our benefit. Con, of course, is that backgrounds are astrophysics, the full astrophysics, and not controlled lab conditions. So that's why also in this talk first, I will tell you something about these backgrounds uh, and only then dwell for a little bit into dark matter searches. So the challenge then, of course, is to devise smart strategies to look for these uncertain signals in uncertain backgrounds. Um, 
with these slides, next few slides, I'm trying sort of to summarize uh, the big picture, like what kind of searches and what kind of models in general are trying to look for. Uh, so the most popular uh, models uh, or somehow quite motivated models, as we know from early universe astrophysics, are uh, those uh, thermal dark matter models. So the idea is the dark matter was thermalized in the early universe through some couplings with standard model, like other particles, like neutrinos, and then it decoupled. And so uh, this is quite natural, again, from studying the standard model behavior in early universe, and also allow us some benchmarks in terms of cross section where we should look for it. So the idea now uh, would be that dark matter, even though it's decoupled in astrophysical systems, it's densely, uh, densely packed enough so that it still annihilates um, to standard model particles. And those would be those cosmic ray messengers uh, uh, that we can look for today. Uh, so this is this is one approach, looking for thermal dark matter. Then we can look, uh, and th those would be typically models around uh, weak scale, so GV a bit below GV to to to, to tens of TV. We'll talk about that uh, in the future. I mean, in in, in these slides, like what, what is the upper bound of this uh, of of this idea? Uh, then we can also look in different models for dark matter decay. A to standard model or conversion to standard model in the medium. So, for example, uh, sterile neutrinos could be there, uh, their decay producing gammas, axions, axion models are such that axion particles in the presence of magnetic fields uh, convert to photons. Um, we could also have dark matter being macroscopic objects, uh, sort of solar mass or above, which would be the so-called primordial black holes, which could then decay or evaporate to standard model particles. So this would be sort of very broadly speaking, a different strategy uh, uh, to look for dark matter through, through, through cosmic rays. And the third one uh, in this very uh, simple schematic approach would to simply continue just looking for gravitational signatures. So as I said, we, we know dark matter is there via gravity, but we can push it to smaller scales. And in that way, sort of try to address, is there any self-interaction of dark matter? Uh, what is the mass of dark matter uh, via gene scale and things like that. So this is good, it works so far. We know it interacts gravitationally, um, but con is that yes, it doesn't allow us to probe non-gravitational cap. Things. There are many data that allow us to, to, to constrain these gravitational lensing, stellar steam disruptions. Uh, it's an exciting field, uh, but I will not focus on this in this talk. Gravitational waves, of course, uh, and so far. So, uh, so in terms of messenger then, so this is a nice plot from UCAP white paper uh, where, where, where authors uh, give all these various models and then various detection methods uh, that, that can be used. So again, from large scale structures, microlensing uh, to uh, gravitational waves, stellar heating and so forth. And then there are these probes with direct cosmic messengers uh, that one can use. And I would be focusing on those that include gamma rays or cosmic rays. Uh, and then those uh, most simply cover the thermal dark matter and the uh, ALP, ALP -like, axion-like particles uh, models. So again, going back now to high energy astrophysics, as I said, uh, having it as a background is hard, but it is also very exciting. Because in, since 2005, 2010, uh, as you will see, we got a lot of lot of new experiments, and so sort of I adapted this uh, this nice cartoon from Stefano uh, because sort of at the beginning, before those experiments were launched or started at 2000s or so, uh, community was extremely excited. First results, they were all super enthusiastic from dark matter community as well. Uh, there were there were lots of data to interpret. However, as you will see now, the data are becoming high quality, and so it's it's a challenge. It's exciting, but it it uh, it pushes us to to improve modeling constantly. Um, so the outline of the talk will be that, as I was saying, I will tell you first about the backgrounds and then implications on dark matter searches. 
so again, uh, here I just show what is today known as multi-messenger astronomy that is based on detection of charged cosmic rays, neutrinos, gammas, and gravitational waves. Uh, here, as I said, I'll focus on charged cosmic rays and gammas, and I just put few of experiments. There are many more, uh, but just to sort of illustrate that all of them are sort of relatively recent, a decade or two. Um, and the general comment on connection actually between uh, charged cosmic rays and gamma rays and neutrinos. Uh, because charged cosmic rays, uh, say uh, in our galaxy, but also in extragalactic one, ones, let's focus on our galaxy for simplicity, uh, they're produced in astrophysical objects, but then their, uh, their motion is uh, bent by magnetic fields because they're charged. And so basically what we observed on Earth is, is not, uh, we don't have directional information, but it's something like smell. We basically feel, we can measure the spectra locally, but it comes, it's integrated information over many sources. Uh, so we have to really disentangle it. Um, at the same time, gamma rays and neutrinos are produced by these charged cosmic rays in their interaction as they propagate in their interaction with the medium. So they are also basically direct probe of the places where these cosmic rays are produced, and they also travel in straight lines. And so gamma rays and neutrinos offer us to see sort of uh, where those cosmic rays are in the galaxy, uh, but still uh, in order to model the gamma rays, we need to understand these interactions of charged cosmic rays with the medium. So this is basically the problem. This is, this is our like, bread and butter, uh, modeling uh, uh, this interaction of cosmic rays and, and the impact on, uh, on neutral messengers. So what is happening recently? So, General wisdom, I will of course not give not go in details of the theory here, but general wisdom is that observed cosmic rays, the, the spectra of observed cosmic rays at Earth is basically a combination of power law of spectra uh, emitted at sources, say supernova remnants or some other sources in the galaxy. They emit power law, uh, co uh, cosmic rays of a, in a power law spectrum, and then uh, with, some, with some power law index. And then that index is further softened by the cosmic ray propagation in the galaxy. So basically what we measure is the power law that is a combination, is basically a sum of power law indexes at the sources and due to propagation. So this is quite simple uh, behavior predicted also analytically uh, and also confirmed numerically with all the codes. Uh, and uh, so it, it's all good and well. And the first data said at the beginning of 2000s, we're all confirming it, the power law, the say proton spectra will ionize power law. However, as we measured further, uh, already in 2011, it was realized that actually the power law is not perfect, that at energies of around 300 GeV of rigidity, there is a break, okay? So this would be the proton uh, and helium spectra, and th these are so-called cosmic ray primaries, and these are secondaries, but both exhibit a break at around 300 GeV, okay? Uh, going further, recently, basically it was realized that this is not the end of the story. After the break, there is a bump at around one TV. These are some preliminary results uh, presented at the ICRC this year. So both Kalet and Dampe uh, managed to measure that, that there is a further break at around TV. So what does it mean? Um, as I was saying, what we measure is basically uh, the, the spectra emitted at sources and modified by propagation. So these breaks could either be in sources, either sources could have some generic break, or it could, be uh, it could appear uh, during the propagation. And so basically, so what is happening now, just very brief uh, update, I mean, just very brief overview, is that the uh, the fact that cosmic uh, that break is introduced in propagation is very likely explanation for the first break at 300 GeV, and this is because diffusion changes uh, in this uh, in this energy range. Uh, so here is a, a nice summary of Fiorenza at Taub that basically. Now we live, uh, if you talk about cosmic rays, we live in this world where we have shifts and breaks and bumps. And so uh, shift is basically that proton and helium spectra are not super aligned in energy. That is not understood. Then this first break at around 300 GeV is sort of understood as a, as, as effect in propagation. But then the bump at around TV, uh, 
it's not understood yet. There are some suggestions saying that it is due to sources, uh, but, uh, but, but this is not established yet. Also, this result is rather new. So bottom line here is that uh, this new data continuously forces us to further theoretical efforts. So this is a you know, very lively field that is lost to understand. And then again, especially in searches for dark matter, uh, this all is exciting but challenging uh, because all this needs to be understood. Uh, before. Uh, of course, as I'll tell you later, we also have gamma rays and neutrinos, multivalence and multi-messenger data that can help us address this uh, in uh, coming on the, in the future. So now moving to gamma rays, um, what are the tools, uh, just, to, uh, just to tell you a little bit about what tools also we are using, because that impacts what we can measure. Uh, so gamma rays are blocked by the atmosphere. So we can, by the atmosphere, so we can either go above it and measure uh, it by satellites or measure it on the ground. And on the ground, uh, we basically measure the showers produced by these gamma rays, uh, either by these optical telescopes that really try to map the shape of a shower uh, in order to know where the gamma ray came from, or by water charing of telescopes that look at a, at a shower as it hits the ground. Uh, there is nice complementarity between these instruments uh, because satellites cover the lowest uh, energies. Uh, so this is 10 to 100 GV, they go down to MeV or so. Uh, uh, because of course, you need, you need a volume in order to contain very highly energetic cosmic rays. And since you cannot launch, I mean, there is limit to how big satellites you can launch. Uh, typically, they, they, are, they give information about lower energies. Uh, then as you go further, uh, you have this imaging chiron of telescopes that look at the showers directly in, in optical ultraviolet that go to tens of TVs or so. And then at high energies, you have this water chiron that can so because also telescopes are quite expensive, so you cannot have huge arrays, at least not uh, uh, so far. Um, and then uh, with water, water charing, you can, you can increase your area and therefore go to higher energies where you have less, smaller number of events. So all this uh, was the situation up to a few years ago. We were going up to 100 TV or so. Now we have the lasso and Tibet array that are combination of water and imaging charing techniques. Uh, and um, and allow us to go up to the PV, opening the PV uh, window in gamma rays. Uh, about what we measure, how the gamma ray sky looks like. Uh, so first thing is the gamma ray counterpart of these cosmic rays I was telling you that come from our galaxy. So as I was saying before, cosmic rays are entangled in the galaxy, in magnetic fields, they come to us, and then you see them in 2D by measuring gamma rays. Okay, so these basically processes are that proton from cosmic rays hits the, ga the gas molecules, hydrogen gas, uh, and produces pions, which then produce gammas, or electrons in the field of the interstellar gas uh, do bremsstrahlung and produce gammas. So that would give gamma rays that has basically the shape of this gas that is a target for cosmic rays to produce gamma rays. Or you also have cosmic ray electrons that produce inverse Compton from stellar light or CMB um, in the galaxy. Okay, and so, so far with Fermilat, we measure, we measure this diffuse emission at energies, I was saying up to hundreds of GV or so, and we can relatively, I mean, we can model this again together with cosmic rays, make a prediction and that agrees rather well with the data. Uh, and then we can go backward. We can say, take these measurements and say something about diffusion in the galaxy. Uh, that would be the name of the game here. Um, and for this, to measure this diffuse emission, you need large field of view uh, instruments uh, that have good cosmic ray background rejection. So Fermilat is very good for that. And it turns out that LASSO is also very good for it, for that. So that we now, uh, for the first time, starting to see this diffuse emission for the from the galaxy at hundreds of TV uh, to PV range. So this is also very exciting. And, uh, and again, this is where the progress uh, will need to be now in the time, theoretical progress in the time going forward to somehow manage to model together what we measure at hundreds of GV up to PV with single modeling. Uh, so expect um, more, more works uh, and theoretical predictions to come in this area. Uh, 
Going further, uh, uh, aside from this diffuse emission along the plane, there is also this thing as Fermi bubbles, like these bubble-like structures emit, uh, emanating from the galactic center region. Uh, so this is something also very interesting. This is not a new result. Uh, they, they've been known for, you know, for 10 years already. Uh, the, what is new is that Ice Cube and Hawk uh, constrain their spectra at higher energies. So we are now quite convinced that the spectra of these Fermi bubbles has a break or a cutoff. Um, and so this is also very relevant, very interesting, of course. It seems that our the center of our galaxy uh, is doing something funny or, or was doing something funny sort of millions of years ago. Um, this is also, so we believe that they're telling us something about the past of the galactic center region, either the supermassive black hole or star formation episodes in the galactic center. Again, this is also very exciting, also very relevant for dark matter searches because as, you, as I will say later, galactic center is also that you expect the most dark matter, I mean, the, the, the larger densities of dark matter in our galaxy. Um, so this is one thing, uh, this diffuse large scale emission that you see on the gamma ray sky. You also see a huge amount of point sources, again, depending on the energy range, but say with Fermi, there are now 8,000 sources detected in uh, it with gamma rays. Uh, also lots of excitement on that front uh, because, for example, one of the big surprises in the past 10 years was that pulsars turn out to be very, uh, very numerous sources in our galaxy. Um, and also there was a new source class, new class of sources detected um, that are so-called TV pulsar halos uh, that was, they were detected with Hawk, uh, that basically allow us to see the region in gamma rays, the region around the pulsars where electrons are still confined. So basically allow us to model now how electrons are leaving pulsars and entering this diffuse medium. And so telling us something about how this cosmic propagation happens very close to sources. Uh, another excitement on this front is that with LASSO, uh, now uh, 43 pavatrons, uh, meaning the sources that emit up to PV energies, are discovered in the galaxy. That was the whole uh, old discussion because, as you might know, in charged cosmic rays, we measure that around PV there is a knee, there is a break in the uh, high energy cosmic ray, charge cosmic ray spectra. And the idea was that the uh, below the knee, uh, those cosmic rays are accelerated in our own galaxy. And so, but so that was just a conjecture. And the, the, the holy grail was to observe actually directly sources in galaxy up to PV to make sure that actually those sources indeed are uh, accelerating in our galaxy. Now with LASSO and with this huge number of pavatrons, we, we are getting there and sort of uh, starting really to probe galactic sources directly that that, that uh, uh, managing to emit up to these huge energies. Again, this is also in terms of dark matter opening a new frontier uh, maybe to look at these high energy, um, at these high energy sources uh, or, or, or high energy sky uh, for signature of dark matter. This is very brief. I will not talk about neutrinos, but it seems that also neutrinos are now starting to be measured around the galactic plane. And so if you look galactic plane around in uh, gamma rays, we are starting now slowly to observe a correlation with uh, significant, uh, significant excesses along the plane. So parts of these uh, neutrinos uh, are obviously exagalactic, but parts of them are also coming uh, from the galactic plane and are related to these cosmic rays and gamma rays that I was discussing. So now going to the dark matter um, uh, searches. So what are then the strategies? How we go around this rich astrophysics? So one strategy is to look for smoking guns, meaning to sources or messengers that we do not expect any astrophysics. So just stay away from astrophysics and look for something that is very particular for dark matter. Uh, that would be one strategy and I will tell you more about that. Uh, second one, is to look for dark matter signatures, uh, but not only in one target or wavelength or messenger, because there are, I mean, having only one measurement, both for astrophysics and dark matter, then it's hard to disentangle, but combine different targets, wavelengths and messengers for the same dark matter models that then allows you extra hand to get rid of the backgrounds. And this is especially important if you have a hint of a signal. Uh, and three is to use advanced statistical procedures to consider higher multiples, cost correlations, machine learning, uh, and so forth. So I will try to give 
uh, some examples, uh, I guess, mostly of the first two, even though the, uh, the third one is also very much being used. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Okay, so about the signal, uh, this is probably you're familiar with. So if you want a signal of dark matter, it will depend on particle physics, obviously, and about co and from cosmology, meaning how much dark matter there is on the way uh, from us to the source. Um, and so, so where do you, of course, you look at n-body simulations for uh, for for guidance where to look in gamma rays. So again, this is the Milky Way overlaid by with the dark matter simulation. Of course, the most of dark matter is in the galactic center. Then there are some subhalos, the largest subhalos that are in our galaxy that will still have stars are called dwarf spheroidal galaxies. So we can look there. There could be, as you know, there is lots of subhalos in dark matter simulations, but some are so small not to have any, any baryonic content, but nonetheless could shine, say, in gamma rays, if, uh, since they should have, they're, they're basically made of dark matter. So this is another target we can look. Or in terms of extragalactically, at, uh, you know, outside of the Milky Way, in the local group, to nearby galaxies, galaxy clusters, or cumulative extragalactic signal. So I will not have time to talk about this, uh, all of it, of course. Uh, uh, I will rather just try to say a few words about these uh, uh, smoking gun signatures uh, and then maybe something about the galactic center. So here is the signal strength versus robustness. So as you see, these smoking gun signatures are extremely robust because they wouldn't have any astrophysics, while here, of course, robustness is very low. Um, so dwarfs, looking for smoking guns in dwarf sidoidal galaxies. So these are the largest subhalos in the um, uh, dark matter subhalos that contain stars. In the, uh, so I will talk about Milky Way dwarf satellites. Um, we now have around 45 dwarfs. Uh, why they're smoking guns? Because they have so few stars and they're so old that you do not expect any gamma rays coming from them uh, in astrophysics. So if you, can, uh, if you detect a signal in gamma rays, it's, uh, it's a sort of a smoking gun signature for dark matter. The latest result here is that five collaborations, gamma ray collaborations, Fermilat, Magic, Veritas, Hest, and Hawk, all came together, uh, analyzed data from 20 dwarfs, and combined them all together. So this is a uh, really excellent collaboration between experiments, and it produced the most stringent constraints in thermal dark matter. So this is expected cross-section thermal models, and then this would be the limits from uh, combining from all these five uh, telescopes. So this is... Um, this is uh, the plot uh, by Marco Tirelli, uh, allegedly all indirect searches, uh, constraints, uh, probably not really all, but combines uh, a number, a large number of them. And you could see that these limits from dwarfs are uh, one of the strongest constraining, uh, constraining the thermal cross-section. So then what are the, this is, this is the current situation. So then what are the frontiers? One frontier here is to go to, you know, to go, for, uh, further down, uh, probing the thermal cross-sections also in the TV range or pushing it all the way down to, to more weakly coupled dark matter uh, in these GV to TV energies or to go to uh, higher energies to heavy PV uh, dark matter. So in terms of frontier two, uh, um, uh, uh, Vera Rubin will discover more dwarfs and together with Fermi, limits are expected to improve. Uh, also, uh, at, a, at a TV range, the CTA, the Cherenkov Telescope Array, will come on board uh, in a few years, and it will, from the galactic center, it will uh, push the limits uh, over the thermal cross-section uh, uh, all the way to tens of TVs or so. Uh, frontier 3, uh, moving to the PV range. So here, we should be very start to be very careful. I took this slide from Kalia uh, Petraki because as we are moving to heavier and heavier dark matter, uh, where its mass is much larger than that of mediators, uh, we have to take into account large uh, long-range interactions, non-perturbative effects. Uh, there could be some enhancements, bound states. We should be very careful. Uh, and also, it's possible that um, unitarity uh, limit does not apply anymore. So. Basically, theoretical advances are needed here. Um, very quickly, 
talk about this uh, bubble here, which is tentative detection of dark matter, the so-called galactic center excess that is now very well established. People have been working on that uh, for 20 years or so. Basically, in the center of our galaxy, there is some signal that is very consistent with being a dark matter. So it's something that really vanilla prediction would give. So that's, that was very, I mean, that's why this galactic center excess continues to be studied because this is exactly how we thought dark matter will look like. But unfortunately, pulsars have the same spectrum uh, as the one detected in the galactic center. And so basically, uh, probably they're the culprits for this, uh, for this signal here. However, we want to be sure, we want to disentangle the two. And so, as I said before, we're understanding pulsars more and more in gamma rays uh, as we have more and more experiments. Uh, but we're also uh, doing multi-target, so this success is in tension with dwarfs, multi-messenger, I will tell you about anti-proton constraints, multi-wavelength, we can study pulsars in radio and detect them in the galactic center. Okay, uh, so this would be galactic center. Moving on to other smoking guns. So another smoking gun that we could look dark, for, from dark matter is the spectral lines. So dark matter, of course, does not couple to photons directly, uh, but via loops uh, can produce uh, dark matter lines, this particular signature that you would not expect from astrophysics. And so we can look basically in spectra from sources or galactic center, for example, as the, most, as the brightest source for dark matter in the galaxy, you could look for a bump. And, um, and uh, so these are the current limits uh, uh, from Hess and from Fermi. And again, the CTA uh, is expected to improve them significantly. So, so very soon we will reach 10 to the minus 28 or so at TV uh, for spectral lines. Uh, this is also very constraining for dark matter models. Uh, another uh, smoking gun I wanted to mention that is very neat. Uh, this is for axion-like particles. Um, let me just give you one slide on that. So as I said before, for axion-like particles, you expect them to, to convert to photons in the presence of magnetic fields. So typically, in this case, your sources, you, you look at sources that have strong magnetic fields and that are at large distances that allow this conversion to happen. And so typically galaxy clusters or faraway sources like AGNs are a good source. So this is a, st a standard strategy that you expect um, uh, this probability for, for conversion uh, to have this uh, oscillating shape, and therefore you expect the spectra of um, gamma ray spectra to have in, intrinsic uh, spectral irregularities. So people look at faraway sources for spectral irregularities and constrain axion like particles. Another smoking gun signature uh, that is very neat would be if there would be a supernova in our galaxy. Um, so if there would be a supernova, uh, then um, uh, uh, axions would be produced uh, in this collapse via primacle process, and then would escape together with neutrinos from the, from the supernova, convert back to photons. And so basically, if you would uh, observe coincidentally uh, neutrinos and photons, this would be a signature of, of axion-like particles uh, being created. So this, of course, all relies on the fact that we need a supernova in our galaxy. It is overdue. Uh, it is. Uh, it should be like two per century, <laughs> small numbers, but um, but this would be a powerful probe and it's a very, uh, very smart uh, sort of detection uh, mechanism. So for example, this would be the ALP dark matter space and if there would be a supernova while Fermilat or some satellite uh, sensitive enough is in the orbit, uh, we would be probing it uh, with, with these messengers. Okay, just last few slides. If you want to constrain dark matter with uh, charged cosmic rays, uh, so as I was saying before, we have only spectral information. We do not have the uh, morphology. So in that case, the trick is to look for antiparticles because for antiparticles, astrophysics produces them less than the, than the dark matter. Uh, so, so this is typically the go-to channel for cosmic ray searches. If one looks in antiprotons, okay, um, what is neat, so this is a paper from 2016 uh, that, that basically shows that modeling antiprotons from AMS, one gets very good constraints on dark matter crossing the thermal cross section. Uh, of course, there's large uncertainties, as I was telling you, in modeling both protons and antiprotons. Uh, 
that are included here, but then somehow exactly in this range that, that uh, corresponds to galactic center excess, we cannot really rule it out uh, via antiprotons because there is also a bump in these limits. There is some sort of like signal uh, that is probably, I mean, again, this is a weird coincidence uh, because sort of this would be consistent models of dark matter to the galactic center could explain also this bump, but there could be many other, uh, other effects uh, that are culprits for this. This is a newer analysis from 2022 uh, that takes into account all possible uncertainties via correlation matrix, uh, still the, has a bump, but, um, but so, so these are the, the, the most updated limits that we have at the moment. And the last thing that I will tell you, one can also look in anti-deuteron and anti-helium channels. So the idea with anti-deuteron is to look um, that astrophysical objects would produce anti-deuteron at energies above one to 10 GV, uh, while dark matter signal could uh, could produce it at uh, is, uh, would produce it at much lower energies. So basically, if one finds anti-deuteron signal at 0.1 GV or so, this could again be a smoking gun of dark matter. Um, the newer results is that AMSO2 has some in, uh, indications of uh, of seven, I think, anti-deuteron events. It also had some, sorry, indications of anti-helium events. These are all unpublished results yet from AMSO2, so 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 it's to be. Uh, I mean, we have to wait and see. Um, uh, but uh, yes, this is some food for the thought. Uh, there is also GAPS experiment. Uh, that should start flying, that should exactly probe this energy range where dark matter should emit. So basically, uh, anti-helium events are very hard to understand in terms of astrophysics or dark matter, while AMS is, uh, you know, getting more sensitive and GAPS is getting more sensitive, so we might uh, detect it in this range. Okay, future. Um, so, Few things, uh, of course, I just talked uh, by design about gamma rays and charged cosmic rays, but there are many probes, uh, many instruments beyond that also, also happening and it can also be used to constrain dark matter. Uh, this is also from white paper, this amount of data versus date of experiment. So together with all these exciting you know, probes, you will also have much more data. <laughs> so another thing is that one could also uh, think about new analysis techniques, and in particular, maybe using machine learning or something that could automatize this search and allow us to, pro and allow us to probe, uh, you know, many of these messengers or targets simultaneously in a smart way. Um, here is some example of some very preliminary work, but I wouldn't dwell into that. So I would just say, that these dark matter indirect searches are exciting multidisciplinary field and there is lots of data to play with. We are entering the TV PV regime. Uh, theoretical progress and uh, is, is definitely needed uh, and the search is widening. Uh, question about new analysis techniques and in particular machine learning um, is can they really be useful in our field, given so many theoretical uncertainties that we have as well. So in, in our field, is it just a hammer in search of for a nail or it's really, really can facilitate real scientific progress. So this is also something to ponder in the future. Um, I would just maybe use a little uh, break, a commercial break, to say that we also have a postdoc. We have a network for machine learning in astroparticles. So yeah, whoever is interested about this, uh, just please uh, come and talk to me. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. You, you were on time. Thank you. Right, so there's plenty of time for questions. Don't be shy. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, I have a few questions, but uh, maybe I'll start with this one. In particular, some of the plots you showed at the end, how model dependent are these predictions? Uh, for for maybe, so, so for, for which particular? I mean, so they're all quite, you know, model dependent. Uh, you When you do this uh, complex modeling, you always have to make assumptions. However, community really, has learned a lot. It, I would say in the last 15 years, like at the beginning, people would just take one model and you know claim this is the thing. Now it's becoming more and more sophisticated and more and more uh, uncertainties are taken into account. Say, for example, here in anti, 
uh, proton constraints, uh, this group uh, of Calore and collaborators really use co correlation matrix of all possible uncertainties that we know, of course, there are unknown unknowns uh, in order to derive these limits. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, people are aware, I mean, more and more aware of, of, of these issues and including them in, in, in the plots. Okay. Uh, can I ask a follow-up question? Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned multi-target analysis, mm -hmm. but I don't think you talked about them. Um, mm -hmm. So I imagine if you do multi-target mm -hmm. analysis, uh, at least when you're looking at systematic modeling, you will gain there. Has there been, has it been done or is it something that's still developing so so right so, so you're very much right that uh, i mean you get rid of uh, part of systematics because astrophysics for example is different in different targets but then you have systematics of how much dark matter you have in one target or the other that is then target dependent and introduces different sort of kind of uncertainties so for example here it was done so here is the signal that we think is that i mean the signal detected in the galactic center to what models of dark matter it would correspond. And then these are the limits from the dwarf galaxies. Okay, so this is sort of multi-target. And taken at the face value, it would seem that uh, observation of dwarfs not seeing dark matter in dwarfs rules out galactic center excess from this plot. But again, as you were saying, uncertainties, you know, factor of two, you know, it's always there in astrophysics in this kind of searches. So that's why we are not saying this is really excluded, but we're saying it's intention because still there are some uncertainties unaccounted for. Yeah, thank you. Yes, sir. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, what's your take on the anti deuteron uh, mm -hmm. events, the seven that uh, M is to? So I'm not asking for the helium, <laughs> that's completely yeah, weird, but maybe we understand uh, anti deuteron. So, so yeah, so this is not exactly my expertise. From what I gather from, from the community, is that those could be. Uh, it wouldn't be crazy, like exactly as you were saying, helium is really far away. For AMS, it could be there. It, I mean, I do not think that they have still energy information uh, very clear and things like that so that we can use the spectra or something like that to say much. But, uh, but those, those probably, I mean, it's to be seen uh, what happens here, but they're not so super excluded is my understanding so they always have these two uh sensitivity bands right do, do you know more about this so uh, it would be somehow consistent with the rich which, yeah band. exactly so these are two detectors exactly so for dark matter we would expect in tof uh while uh, these are in the rich so i'm not actually um I mean, I do not know if more, how much more is known here. So from whatever I read, people were like this saying, you know, let's wait and see. Uh, yeah. Thank you. So I'm interested in the cutoff of the gamma ray spectrum at diffuse emission. Mm -hmm. So there is a mention about the 30 TeV cutoff. Is it observational one or theoretically motivated value? Uh, so just, uh, so you're saying, uh, of it, uh, this PV. Uh, 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 yeah, this this one. Yeah. Yes. So, so, so you're saying this thing here. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. So, so the question is, is it reasonable to have a cutoff or? Yeah, so, so I think, uh, so again, this is also rather, rather new result, and uh, I think community still needs to digest it and to understand correctly. The claim here was that the usual diffuse, so this would be the prediction for the normal diffuse emission, mm -hmm. uh, that it cannot explain that we need new sources. Okay. Uh, and, and the fact that the, those sources would have a cutoff around PV, I think it's reasonable. I mean, we are starting now to see pevatrons, uh, but uh, it could be, it could be. Uh, still, I'm not yet convinced uh, if, we, uh, I mean, this how, uh, I mean, again, talking about uncertainties, like how properly uncertainties in these predictions were taking account for this black line and how large indeed is the need for new source classes for to understand pevatron emission. Okay, thank you very much. Hello, uh, hello, Gabriela. Thank you for the very nice talk. Uh, I just had like two very naive questions. Uh, one was regarding the Fermi LAT. 
Uh, so I was reading in a certain paper that they were uh, going to use the timing and polarizations of uh, pulsars, uh, like like basically pulsar timing arrays from the Fermi LAT. Um, uh, I mean, with with respect to their gamma ray emissions, uh, with which they were supposed to like detect different kinds of dark matter. I think specifically uh, like stochastic wave dark matter or something. Like if you could elaborate a bit more on that, if you have. Any idea? Yeah, so sorry, I'm not very knowledgeable about that. Let's talk after. Uh, sure, sure. It sounds I, like a very cool idea. Yeah, <laughs> I, I had just one more question. Is like, um, so traditionally, how we would uh, try to constrain like the scattering, say, so, say the scattering cross section, we would include in, in say, a CAMB like code or something, and then we would constrain it by uh, via a Bayesian parameter estimation. Uh, how would we, uh, like, with respect to the machine learning part, like, how would we want to do that? Like, because your slides were there, but like, like I would uh, like to talk to you more about that, maybe. Sure, so, sure, yeah. sure. Right. So, so exactly. So, from with machine learning, you have to. I mean, I mean, you have to know how to ask the question, like what it is that you you know want to train. Okay. train yeah. So, would would you have to like make certain simulations, then train that uh, exactly. with the model, and then exactly, exactly. So, okay. attempts that have been done so far were to train on the models we have. And then to recover the normalization, and then to show you the real data, and to recover normalization of those templates that we would show it. So we would we'll show you the images of astrophysical signal, images of dark matter, and then tell it, you know, look at the data and tell us how much dark matter is there. And then you get reality normalization to your template, so you can sort of set limits or find signals and things like that. But with machine learning, then trick is even more so the statistical interpretation. It will give you a number, then you know how to interpret it statistically then there are these reality gaps because as long as you have training data everything is nice and smooth when you show it real data is it really part of it and things like right. that so there's lots lots to do there but might be a promising venue should yeah. be promising venue right. thank you thank you so much sure. Hello, thank you for the yes. talk. Um, one question about the um, the neutrinos, uh, um, sorry, the, the axion mm -hmm, mm -hmm. measurement that you were talking about from supernova. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is that a, a measurement that we should expect exclusively from, from axion dark matter, for instance, or uh, axion-like mm -hmm. particles? Or could there be, for example, some similar thing happening at the nuclear level inside the star that could explain the same measurement? So, so right. So it's very hard for gamma rays. So there should be gamma rays from supernovae, but for them it takes longer to escape. They, they scatter within the within the supernova, and so typically you expect them to arrive after neutrinos. And so you, I mean, I don't know if Alps are the only one mod, uh, exotic model, but you need some exotics in order to run, to escape without interaction within the star, and then convert later to gammas outside of a star, uh, outside the supernova. Okay, say so thank you. So, Thanks. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. Ah. Uh -huh. All right, that's a good question. So I do not have a plot here. I should have put it. Uh, let me see. So again, um, with collider searches you always have to be model dependent of course because uh, you probe one sort of coupling going to say gammas and another sort of in production and so there are plots i mean there are studies when you do um when you do simple assumptions on how those loop, loops look like that allow you then to combine indirect searches and colliders and direct detection searches uh, uh yes well so exactly so it depends uh, uh in which in which models you look like but yeah indirect searches can can improve the limits for 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 class of models unfortunately i don't have i don't have here the the plots yeah good 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 point yeah thank you working sounds good
Thanks. Hey, hi everyone. Um, so yeah, this is a talk about dark energy and modified gravity. And when putting the talk together, I thought about what, what do I normally want to try and get from, from plenary talks at conferences like this? Um, and I figured that what I, what I normally like to try and have is, is an overview of where the field is at the moment and a sense of what are the reasons to be excited about the field. So that is how I've structured this talk. Um, so we're going to start with, with where we currently are, and then I'm going to do a tour through some of what I think are the particularly exciting kind of things that are going on in this field at the moment. A um, little bit of theory, a little bit of phenomenology, and some, some observational stuff. And, and as the other speakers this morning, um, because I'm going to try and cover a lot, I'm, I'm really sorry to those whose work that I'm not going to uh, be able have time to talk about or, or to cite, but I've done my best. Um, okay, so where are we now? Um, so this was, uh, as best as I could, the, the definitive statement that I think everybody in this room will agree with, which is that our, our universe is well described by a Lambda CDM model with a cosmological constant um, with this particular value, which we if we turn it into an energy density, um, gives us an energy density of about 10 to the minus three electron volts to the fourth power, okay? Now there's an asterisk on the well, because I know that a lot of people here are interested in, in tensions in, in the standard cosmological model. Um, this is not what that talk, this, that is not what this talk is about, but uh, you know, to acknowledge that it's not perfect, um, but that this is kind of the, the framework that we all work within. And the other piece of, of this picture, of course, is that this is a really weird number for this uh, parameter to have, okay? Now, to remind you um, of why that's, uh, that's a weird number, just very briefly going to take you through um, what you will have seen in your cosmology courses, which is the, the, the cosmological constant problem, which is that we can get a, a cosmological constant in the Einstein equations. If we're just doing classical gravity, that's perfectly fine. We put the constant in there, we choose a value for it that matches our observations and, and job done. But the problem is that there are other things in our universe apart from gravity, um, and that's all of the matter that lives on the right-hand side of the Einstein equation. And if any of that matter has an energy density associated to the vacuum, that is going to gravitate in exactly the same way as a cosmological constant, basically, because the vacuum is constant and Lorentz invariant, it looks exactly like a, like a cosmological constant term. Um, and so we, we'd not only have to, to choose the value of that parameter to match our observations, but we have to make sure that it balances all of these contributions. Now there are classical contributions to that vacuum energy every time the universe goes through a phase transition. Um, so like the electroweak phase transition gives us a change in this vacuum energy. But the, the even bigger, if you like, problems come about when we try and include quantum physics in this picture as well, because the quantum fluctuations in the vacuum also gravitate. And when we try and compute what those give us, we get a very large number. And that's why that 10 to the minus three electron volts on that first slide is so weird. Because, so this is, this is the sort of standard calculation that, that you might have seen of thinking about computing this vacuum energy as a simple harmonic oscillator in flat space. Um, we do that integral, we get a divergent answer. You use your favorite quantum field theory technique to deal with divergent integrals. Um, and you get an answer that scales like the fourth power of the mass scale that you've put in to your theory. And one thing I think that we can be very sure of in physics is that there are mass scales that are higher than 10 to the minus three electron volts. So there's a mismatch here between what our predictions are giving us and what our observations are telling us. Um, now you might justifiably say, well, the universe is not actually flat space filled with quantum harmonic, simple harmonic oscillators. But as you iterate this calculation, as you include curved space time and gravitons and, and all of the fields that you want to put in, the same story remains at the end of the day, that this vacuum energy density contribution scales like the fourth power of, of a mass scale, um, which is higher than 10 to the minus three electron volts. 
And you could also at this point say, well, I don't care, right? I'm just gonna tune it away. Um, I, I've got this constant in my Einstein equations. I just tune it to get rid of this, this large number. But it's difficult to do that in a way that is radiatively stable. That means that you don't have to keep tuning a large number every time you go to next order in loop calculations without knowing what the UV completion of your gravity and your quantum physics are. Okay. So this is why that number is weird. And obviously people have been thinking about ways to, to solve this problem, which I, I sort of roughly tried to classify here. Um, we can either, we can stop, one thing we can say is we can say that the vacuum energy gravitates differently, okay? Maybe gravity works differently for sources that have infinite length scales, infinite correlation length scales. Um, maybe gravity just works differently on the largest scales in the universe. Uh, the next alternative is that we're just doing this vacuum energy calculation wrong. Maybe our understanding of quantum field theory isn't complete. Maybe there's UV physics that we're not taking into account in the vacuum that resums all of those large contributions in a way that gives us a nice answer at the end of the day. Maybe there's some, some symmetry that we don't currently understand that just sets all of these contributions to zero. Now, obviously, if, if, if the true value of the cosmological constant is actually zero, we still need to explain why we don't see it being zero. That's the next level of weirdness in that value that we, we observe. So we then need to add in some transitory new physics to produce the acceleration of the expansion that we see that often gets called quintessence. Um, but yeah, sort of something that gives us a, a period, transitory period of, of accelerated expansion. Um, or maybe you believe we live in some higher dimensional, more UV complete theory, um, and the cosmological constant is solved just because there are many different vacua in there, or there's some complicated dynamical evolution that gives us the value we observe. Um, sometimes this also gets combined with anthropics. If you've got many, many different vacua, maybe we just pick out the one that is friendly for us to live in. Okay. So there's, there's work on, on all of these different approaches. Um, and I think it's fair to say that there isn't really a consensus in the community at the moment about any one of, of these being, you know, the favored approach. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of open questions and a lot of work still to be done on trying to understand why the cosmological constant has the value that it has. But one of the things, and this is why I have these two parts of the title of my talk, is that it does mo motivate us to think about whether gravity can be modified, how it can be modified, what are the consequences of that, um, and how we might see them. Okay. So I said that our current picture gives us a universe with, um, with a cosmological constant. Um, one of the things that we can ask with the data we have. Okay. Oh, yeah, sure. No worries. Okay, we're back. Um, one of the things we can ask with the data we have is, is, it, is, is the cosmological constant that we're seeing, is the source of this accelerated expansion truly actually a constant? Um, so this is from the, the Dark Energy Survey Year 3 results, um, asking if, if we think of this contribution as a perfect fluid with an equation of state, does that equation of state vary? vary with time, or in this case, with, with the scale factor A of the universe. So this is the constant piece on the horizontal axis and the time varying piece on the vertical axis. And if, uh, if it truly is a constant cosmological constant, then we'd be living at the intersection of those two uh, lines. Now, 
the, the data, you can see that this now is really a question that we can ask with the data that we have. Uh, and certainly a cosmological constant is consistent with the data uh, that we're seeing, but there is there's wiggle room here, right? This is not a definitive statement yet of whether or not there, there's evolution uh, in the data. Why are my slides not changing? Perfect. Okay. Sorry. Um, so the other thing that we can ask with the cosmological data we have is that we can start to ask questions about whether gravity is really working as expected. Um, and you can ask kind of very, very model independent um, questions. Like, so we can just try to parameterize deviations to the standard gravitational equations in, in cosmology. So the Poisson and the lensing equations, we get these two parameters, mu and sigma in this, in this parameterization, but they depend on scale factor and on scale, right? So then if you want to try and constrain them, you still have to make choices, at least at the level of the data we have of how they scale. So this plot, they're chosen to scale um, like the fractional component of cosmological constant in our universe. You could obviously make different choices there. You would get slightly different constraints, but the picture at the end of the day is the same. So these are our two constants, sigma and mu. Um, and again, uh, a universe that is uh, just standard gravity is the intersection of the two uh, dashed lines. And that's certainly what, what the data is consistent with here. But again, there, there's wiggle room there for, for something, something to exist. So scope for future observations to, to improve. But we don't just test gravity in cosmology. We can test gravity on all sorts of other scales as well. And one of the things that I will go on to talk about is the fact that you probably do want to test gravity on lots of different scales in order to try and solve these problems. So here is um one of the uh types of of additional kind of force an additional gravitational force or modification of gravity that you might want to think about so we've added in an extra field with some mass some coupling to matter that's given us a, con a correction to our newtonian potential and that's something you can try and constrain within the solar system and in the lab and the constraints are really really tight okay people have been looking for this for a long time to very high degrees of precision and, and haven't seen anything yet. Obviously it gets harder as you go to shorter distance scales, um, but the, the constraints are, are already very good. So this is the landscape of testing, testing gravity and all of the different things that you might wanna think about and look at. So this is a plot where we've got gravitational potential on the horizontal axis and an a proxy for gravitational curvature on the vertical axis. Um, and if you're thinking about your background cosmology, then you just go down in curvature, down, down the axis from early times with high curvatures to late times with low curvatures. But on top of this, we've got all of the different types of objects that can be in our universe that could have um, potential gravitational potentials. So neutron stars and black holes up here, uh, galaxies down here, um, stars in the middle. Um, so we've got a huge range of scales to go at a huge variety of different types of objects to think about, which is why this is such a such a challenging project um, to, to really say, is gravity really working as expected on all of these different scales in all of these different environments? Okay, so what are the reasons uh, for being excited about what's going on in this field at the moment? Well, the first one um, is, is the Euclid satellite. I don't think that is a surprise to anyone. So Euclid launched successfully on the 1st of July in 2023. Um, and we, we've already had these nice sort of first light images shared from the collaboration that, that seem to indicate that everything is working really, really nicely. It's looking in the visible and infrared, and it's a really a dedicated mission to, to look at the dark sector of our universe and the geometry of our space time. 
I think those of us who were around in, in 2011 when, when ESA decided it, were gonna, it was gonna support Euclid will remember how much of a, of a game changer it was for the field, how much interest and, and the number of people working on dark energy and modified gravity changed when, when Euclid was, was announced. And it's really amazing to, to see this come to fruition and very excited to see the data that we're gonna get from that. To give you a sense of what Euclid is gonna do for us, um, this is the picture that we were just looking at, this question of is the cosmological constant constant? Okay, so it's varying with the scale factor, constant piece on the horizontal axis, time varying piece on the vertical axis. This is our current picture from, from the DES survey. And this is a forecast for what Euclid can do on the right. And you can already see by the change in scale on the axis, right, the, the level of improvement that, um, that is likely to come uh, with Euclid. Okay. okay, continuing my tour, my, my brief tour on things that are exciting, um, quite a, a bit with a big change of topic. Um, to talk about string theory and the swamplands. Now, if if you're not interested or or don't like string theory, feel free to ignore the next two slides. Um, but I think it's worth at least being aware of what what the people who work on arguably our most well studied attempt to um, to build a unified theory are saying about this topic. Um, so to try and, and very briefly set this out for you, what the Swampland conjecture says is that basically within the consistent calculations that people know how to do within string theory, um, it's hard, well, it's, um, it's not possible to find a de Sitter vacuum, so a, a vacuum state that has a positive cosmological constant. You get these either or conditions, right? So either, so if, the, if we're thinking of V as some potential that describes all of the different possible vacua, so you can think of it, if you like, as a scalar field potential, um, either there's a lower bound on the first derivative, um, so there's just no extrema at, at, that, at the point you're thinking about, or if there is an extremum, that there's a negative um, eigenvalue at that extremum, right? So it's an unstable direction, it's not a stable extremum. So in principle, from this condition, like hilltops are allowed. You can imagine us kind of, for whatever reason, being delicately balanced on the top of the hill, that would be consistent um, with, with these conditions, but to, to live in a nice stable minimum with a positive cosmological constant appears to be impossible to calculate currently within string theory. Um, right. So this, this reignited, I think, a little bit in the last few years, interest in, in quintessence models, because it says maybe, maybe there isn't a true kind of positive cosmological constant minimum, but this, this kind of hilltop um, scenarios that are allowed, maybe they allow quintessence as you sort of roll off uh, that hilltop. But in the last kind of year or so, people have been looking at this in, in more detail, trying to build models of quintessence within kind of these robust string theory calculations. And the story that appears to be emerging is that it's just as hard to get quintessence as it is to get a, co a positive cosmological constant in the first place, okay? And that's because you're trying to get this weird energy scale out, this low energy scale out of string theory in a stable way. You've still got to pass all of these tests on, on modified gravity that we talked about. Um, and you've got to do the, the calculation robustly. So I think this is not a finished story, but that kind of seems to be the state of what, what people are saying at the moment. Okay, so moving away from grand unified theories to, to phenomenology, I think there's, sorry, there's lots to be excited about here, just because there's there's so many, interesting things that can happen and, and so much scope still for exploring what is possible and what is allowed. Now in this part of the talk I really am just going to focus on on scalar field modifications of, of gravity um, with apologies to those I know there are many in the audience who work on 
um, modifications involving vector and tensor fields. Um, but this sort of the, the big picture that I'm going to talk about still applies to all of the different ways that you can modify gravity. Um, but we can think about light scalar fields because we either get them directly because we put them in as our quintessence field or that they come out of a lot of the ways that we, we think about modifying gravity. And just as an aside, um, I think a lot of the scalar field models that we study in the context of modified gravity are basically the same scalar field models that people are now studying as ultralight dark matter models with maybe slightly different choices of parameters, but all of the same physics. So you, to give you an example of how this works, how scalar fields come from modifications of gravity and what they might look like, I'm just going to quickly take you through an example. So this, this is an action for a particular type of modified gravity. We're going to, it's an F of R modification of gravity. So we've got our standard Einstein-Hilbert term here. All of our matter fields tidied away in this matter action here. And our modification is that we've added some other function of R into our action. Now, if we do some potentially perverse looking field definitions at this point, we can we find that a, a scalar field emerges explicitly in our model. And actually, um, we can recast without changing the physics, right? These are just field redefinitions. They don't, they don't change any of the physics. This, this theory with the modification of gravity becomes equivalent to um, a theory that just has a standard Einstein-Hilbert term, so standard gravity, plus a scalar field with some potential, plus now our matter fields are moving, but they're, the metric that they move on depends on our scalar field. And that's where the, the influence of our scalar field shows up. And then if I take this one step further, and apologies for, for the mass of equations, and I think about what those, um, what those matter fields are doing, what, the, what that interaction really looks like at the level of particles. Um, so this is a sort of toy model of a standard model with a Higgs field here and a standard model fermion here. What we find, is that actually the only coupling that you get to the standard model is that our new scalar field couples to the Higgs. So this is really, uh, if we can recast our theory, we can have it as, a, as an F of R modification of gravity. We can have it as in this form as a scalar tensor modified gravity theory, or in this version as a Higgs portal model. But just to, um, just to stress again, these are all just different ways of seeing the same physics. But the, what these different pictures give you is it makes different kinds of physics more obvious, right? Um, so in all of them, what we get is that our scalar field mediates a fifth force and gives us this correction to the Newtonian potential that we saw before, depending on the scalar mass and its coupling. Um, but we might, and some of the things that I'm going to talk about will motivate, you know, thinking about it in this picture, you may be kind of it's natural to think about collider signatures, whereas in the other pictures, maybe other physics is easier to study. So the coupling to matter is the problem, right? We said oh, that if we have these kinds of, um, this kind of modification of gravity, this extra Yukawa potential, that it's really, really well constrained, okay? That we've done lots and lots of observations in the solar system and, and in our labs, that, that constrain it. So, you know, what's what's the point of talking about these modifications of gravity if they're if they're already ruled out? So, can we forbid our our extra degrees of freedom, our extra scalar field, from coupling to matter? Um, and the answer is yes. We we can do that. We can impose that there is scale invariance in our model. Um, for example, if the Higgs mass isn't a hard scale, if it emerges through some dynamical properties, then we don't get that coupling that I just talked about. And there's no coupling of our scalar field to matter. Maybe that's maybe, and then everything is fine. Okay. But again, the problem with that is that when we start to think about loops, start to think about this as a quantum field theory and how we would renormalize. You can't do that, at least in the standard ways that we know about, without reintroducing scales and reintroducing problems. So, um, again, either you've got to do something different there, or your your fifth forces come back. So then you could ask, well, okay, maybe I can't forbid it altogether, but can I suppress these extra forces? Is there a way of having 
modified gravity in my universe that is important in some places but not important anywhere where so far we have we have been uh doing experiments and we've been there, there's now a a range of different things that we know how to do here um that we know emerge rather from these theories um where instead of just tuning this extra fifth force away we can dynamically make it weak in the dense environments where we're doing our calculations right we can we can uh, arrange to get weak couplings we can arrange for our scalar fields to get a very large mass therefore be hidden from our experiments or we can arrange to get to make it difficult for the scalar to propagate and those give us interesting types of of behavior so if we go back to thinking about our fifth force potential between these two masses um what they do is they either change the way in which some some lump of matter sources our fifth force instead of all of the mass of the object sourcing this extra force what happens is that just a thin shell of surf near the surface of the object sources the extra force and that's why it's not as strong as you would have thought or we change how this potential varies with distance um and far away from an object you you see the fifth force and then inside some uh some new screening radius uh you don't see the fifth force anymore and one of the things that this can give you and this is why i think this this field is exciting is it gives us really new um new signatures to go and look for right so this idea that um, perhaps in these theories there is a fifth force, but for large enough objects, only it's only acting on a thin shell around a heavy object means that you get you you can, in certain in scenarios you can get a picture like this one on the right, right, where you drop a small object and a large object, and the small object feels the extra force, but the large object doesn't, and so the smaller object falls faster than the larger one. Okay, I'm going to come back to this point um, as we as we go on. I think in the interest of time, I'm going to have to skip talking about this in detail, but also just to say uh, what I've been talking about so far has been specific models where we can probe in detail and compute the dynamics. We do also know how to write down just the, the most complete, most complicated, if you like, um, scalar tensor theory that, that we can. And again, we can we can try and study and constrain these parameters, but we have to make choices for all of these free functions that appear in the model. So constraining the full theory, still quite a challenging prospect with the data that we have. Now, one frontier that I think is opening up here where, um, where there are new and interesting things to, to say is, is the idea of testing gravity on, on the scale of galaxies. Now, this is something that perhaps hasn't been done so much before because well partly because galaxies are messy they're in the the non-linear regime of cosmological perturbation theory there's a lot we don't know about the dark matter as well so why would you go looking for um modified gravity there as well but i think we're, we're, we've reached a point where the data is good enough to start doing that and especially if you've got smoking gun signatures that you can go look for that really are not degenerate with the, your uncertainties on dark matter um, then, then this is a sort of an exciting opportunity to to see something new. So here's just one one example of something you could think about doing, exploiting what we've just been talking about about this prediction of certain theories that small objects fall faster than large objects, because in in a very naive picture of a galaxy, galaxies are composed of small objects and large objects. Um, now our galactic disk has lots of stars in it. They are large objects in this classification but it also has gas and what might be particulate dark matter um, in in the galaxy and those count as small objects okay and in which case you might expect the gas and the dark matter halo to fall faster in a gravitational potential well than the stars that the stellar disk would be left behind and you would see an offset and potentially a distortion in the shape of the galactic disk as a result of that and there's been some really nice analysis of the, the data, the galactic data sets that we have um, looking for this effect um, and which have got to the point of constraining. So what is on, in this plot on the on the right here is 
So this is thinking about our modification again as an f of r model. Uh, this is this is the the one parameter of that model along the vertical axis here. Um, and then when the line is below, when the colored lines are below the the that, the sorry the gray horizontal line, we would say that the the model is excluded. And the conclusion of this paper was that f of r modified gravity models are ex are excluded to the point that there's no point in looking for them on astrophysical scales anymore. However, I just want to to caveat that with with the statement that as our observational data gets better, as theorists, we have to make sure that our predictions keep up in terms of accuracy. Um, and there's a common assumption that that is made when when studying these things that you can say whether or not um, the an object should feel the fifth force by thinking about its gravitational potential at the surface. Um, let's say that's that's for this condition that this is the gravitational potential has to be um, deeper than than something that depends on your model parameters. Um, so this is something that we've been looking at recently, and if you're interested in more details of this, come and talk to me. But better go and talk to to my student Bradley and have a look at his poster. But this is again, this is our f of r. This is our modif modified gravity parameter. This is the mass of the galaxy on the horizontal axis. This is looking at the mass in the disk. This is looking at the mass in the halo. And this, um, what we, what you previously might have used as your um, tool for judging whether a galaxy is screened or not, would say that the dividing line is this dashed gray line on these two plots. Um, that above here, you would have said things were unscreened, and no, other way around. Yes, unscreened, and down here, you would have said they were screened. But actually, when you compute things more carefully and think about the distribution of matter in a galaxy, actually the line you would have to care about are these white lines in the plot. Okay, that's the, that's the dividing line between fully unscreened or not. So you might be off by maybe an order of magnitude or two. So it's just, just a, um, a word of caution that these are complicated theories, they're nonlinear, and um, the theoretical computations are hard, but need to be done if we want to compute things accuracy, accurately. Okay. Possibly final reason for excitement for this talk um, is just the advances in, in precision sensing that we are getting at the moment. So the buzzwords here are quantum technologies. Um, but before I talk about them, uh, I wanted to, to highlight the results that we got last year from the microscope satellite, the microscope mission, um, which was looking to constrain this equivalence principle parameter. So this is asking the question, if I take two objects, do they fall in the same way under gravity or is there a difference in their acceleration? So this is not the small objects and large objects thing that I was talking about before. This is just, in this case, two cylinders made of different material. Do they fall differently in the gravitational field of the Earth? Um, and Microscope were able to constrain this parameter. So this is a difference in acceleration um, divided by the sum. Uh, down to the level of 10 to the minus 15. That's an improvement of almost two orders of magnitude over the previous best result. Um, and again, is is just showing kind of the incredible precision that we have a, in terms of measuring, um, of testing gravity, the, the enormous success that gravity has in passing all of these, these tests and the challenges we face when we're thinking about modifying our theories of gravity that we have such such enormous precision on on these measurements now quantum technologies have have got a lot of interest uh recently um a lot of money invested in them for various reasons um and they also but basically they're just super precision super precise sensors um which is great if what you want to do is is test gravity really precisely so one of these techniques that people are using is atom interferometry. This is the idea that you can interfere different parts of a quantum wave function. So this is, if we cool our atoms down, we hold them at some position in our experiments as a position as a function of time. And then we put them into a superposition of states that we separate spatially. So we take things apart, we reflect them back together and then we recombine them at the end. So this is, this is the same principle as an optical interferometer. It's just atomic wave functions rather than photon waves. Um, 
And it turns out that what you can measure, if, if our atoms are freely falling with some acceleration uh, in, in this interferometer, that you can measure at the output uh, the probability that they're in an excited state. And that is a function of uh, the wave function of the laser that you've been kicking them with, the time between the laser pulses, and A, which is the acceleration that they've experienced. So this is a direct measurement um, of acceleration. And if we cast our minds back to what I was telling you about it being interesting to look at whether small objects and large objects fall in the same way, turns out that atoms are really good small objects. And so if you can measure uh, their acceleration really well, that gives you a really good probe of some of these modified gravity theories. So this is an example of the parameter space. It's a three parameter space for these chameleon models um, with lambda n and capital M. So lambda, the strength of the self interactions of the scalar field, m, the coupling to matter, which on this right hand plot, unfortunately, is beta, um, and n, kind of the exact form of this interaction, um, self-interaction of the scalar field. Um, and putting together a whole bunch of different, and you can see that this is mostly laboratory scale experiments. These are uh, atomic spectroscopy, the atom interferometry that I've been talking about here, torsion balance constraints, and this red one, um, a new um, really nicely designed force sensor in China. Um, getting to the point that they're really ruling out the interesting parameter space for, for these models, right? The interest we've said is in probing things at energy scales around 10 to the minus three EV, which would be that horizontal black line across this plot. And you can see that now we have, all of the experiments have covered, essentially covered that line. So potentially we're at the point of ruling out these cosmological models with um, terrestrial tabletop experiments. Okay. Um, I think, yeah. So I know that um, there are going to be other talks in this conference about strong gravity, so I won't go into details here, but just to say that the, the progress people are making in this field is also really exciting for the potential for testing theories of modified gravity. Um, I'm sure everybody uh, who's thought about this has heard, heard about the... the um, immensely constraining observation that gravitational waves travel at the speed of light. That ruled out uh, quite a large swathe of things that people were working on at the time when that was observed. But there's still, um, there are still models that don't predict that gravitational waves travel at different speeds that we can potentially still try uh, and constrain with gravitational waves. And also, now that we have observations of, of black holes, of their shadows, um, and accretion disks, this, the potential for, for new tests here as well. Okay, so to summarize, um, our universe is well described by a lambda CDM model with a cosmological constant with a particularly weird value that we still struggle to explain. Um, that motivates all sorts of different theories and, and explorations. And this is a really, really exciting time for thinking about that. We've got Euclid uh, launched data around the corner, um, other future surveys that, that people have talked about, theoretical developments, improvements in our understanding of the phenomenology of modified gravity, and all sorts of different tests on different scales that are going to come together to give us this picture of, of where or if we are allowed to modify gravity at all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. It's really nice. Okay, so we have time for questions before lunch. Yes. Thank you. Um, the number 10 to the minus 3 EV is suggestive, right? It's close to neutrino mass. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, are there ideas in this direction to unify those two? Yeah, so people definitely have thought about, almost certainly people in this room have thought about that. Um, and whether you can tie um, tie the, ob the observed expansion to neutrino masses or something that neutrinos are doing in, in the late universe. Um, I think 
it's challenging to do and it's challenging to do as we understand neutrinos better um, to add in things that couple to neutrinos without you know messing up neutrino oscillations or giving the mass or things like that um, and it also doesn't it's hard to do that in a way which solves the fundamental problem of why the cosmological constant is not higher right because if the, if it's connected to the neutrino masses then okay fluctuations of neutrinos in the vacuum give you the right um the right scale for your cosmological constant but then why don't electrons give you give you the same thing right why are they why do we not see it at the electron mass or the higgs mass or something so it's it's interesting to explore for sure but i i haven't seen anything that again is is this sort of convincing that this is the the thing to that solves the problem um thank you for the very nice talk my question is maybe a bit philosophical but uh so when you talk about the higgs field which mm. is a scalar we can always associate it to a particle that we can detect in the lhc when we write an f of r when we rewrite an f of r gravity as a scalar field in gr are we still talking about a particle that we can detect in a detector one day yeah so i would say yes um i would say if you've written down an f of r theory what you've actually written down is a theory of gravity that has more degrees of freedom in the gravitational sector so you you still have your um your your two massless gravitons but you also have a scalar mode in the in the gravitational sector as well and all that we're doing by rewriting the theory in these different ways is making that scalar mode explicit um so, so my philosophy on all of these things is not to spend time arguing about whether something is modified gravity or you, or, or a new particle but instead what, what well certainly from the point of view of phenomenology what you care about is what what um what fields do you have in your theory how do they interact how do they interact with gravity how do they interact with matter how do they interact with them with themselves and once once you've sort of set up all of those things then you can go and compute the observational consequences A question slash comment. I just want to to ask you what is your opinion? Something uh, you talked about um, dark energy and how uh, modified gravity can actually assist in this direction. But modified gravity is also used uh, for inflation because if you apply the Swamp Lang conjectures to inflation model building as well, mm -hmm. there is a problem as well there. And uh, uh, usually because there are in modified gravity setups. Uh, it uh, it appears to flatten the potential of uh, of your uh, corresponding scalar field, the, the degree of freedom that comes from modified gravity. Uh, it's supposed to assist, but then you just now said that uh, you can't really make a distinction between the scalar field and the modified gravity setup. It's a, a different way of actually setting things. So, are you saying that the Swampler conjectures actually? restrict modified gravity setups in that sense um okay so so to to sort of try and disentangle the the the, the parts of your comment i think it's still easier for i mean i'm not a string theorist but my understanding it's easier for inflation to get around the swamp land conjecture because a you're trying to get a higher energy scale um which is just maybe closer to your string theory scales you're not trying to get this low energy scale out at the end of the day and because your inflationary particle uh, maybe is more massive, you also don't have to worry about passing all of those tests of gravity. So those those new papers about quintessence is hard. I don't think they necessarily apply to inflation in the same way. Well, you have the spectral index problem. Yes. Yeah. No. I'm not. I'm, I'm not saying that that everything is easy. Um, but just that the, the the statements I said about quintessence don't directly translate to to inflation. Um, I, I, well, okay, if you're asking me for my opinion, um, is that the, the Swampland conjecture is really probably still more of a comment about string theory than it is a, about cosmology. It, it's about trying to, to, to carefully delineate what can be consistently calculated in string theory. And the fact that you can't reproduce cosmology possibly currently is maybe more of a problem for string theorists then something that, that we should be worried about. I think if you had different people standing in front of you, they might give you a different answer, but that's that's my take. Thank you. Yeah.
Yeah, thanks for the very nice talk. Um, you mentioned at some point that um, if you have these modified gravity theories, there is also the possibility in principle that, for example, the Higgs mass might be dynamically generated. So I was wondering, is there, like, are there some some consequences if, for example, uh, in these modi modified gravity theories, you would consider something like an ultralight reluxion field to be the, yeah, the field for dark energy is is there some some observable consequence of this yeah so no you're, you're absolutely right that this is kind of what i was getting at here that, that this is really where i think the the dots join up between what we are studying from the modified gravity side and what people are studying for for relaxions or or, or ultralight dark matter models um and at that level i, th I think this is a relaxion model basically or it already is a higgs portal model um with slightly different energy scales because you're you're motivating slightly slightly different scales in in the problem um so yeah on, on and and this is this is kind of what i again what i personally think is interesting is that i think there's a lot for the, the two communities as we make this connection to to learn from each other right modified if you're studying modified gravity you don't often talk about collider constraints maybe um and and possibly we have some interesting things to say about nonlinear behavior that is not necessarily kind of always uh, and ways of avoiding fifth force constraints that maybe the relaxion people don't talk about so much thanks Imagine that we detect W not different from minus one, so we have some evidence of modified gravity from large scale structure. What would you think that you, we would be able to distinguish? What theory is causing that? And if not, what would you suggest to do? If, yeah. To this angle? No, that's that's a great question. Um, so I think if we do see, um, so one of the big problems that we have at the moment is this enormous landscape that we have, right? Of all of these different probes, we don't really have anything to guide us as to the scales and the problem other than the Planck scale and the cosmological constant scale, which are enormously separated. Um, so I think if you see, like on, on the basic level, if you see uh, that the equation of state is not constant, you start to be able to get a new sense of the scales of the problem, right? You see, you know, if you can make that measurement, you see how the cosmological constant is varying in time. If, if as you start to make that better, maybe you can get a sense of when that starts or if there is a turn on um, and all of those things are going to say, OK, this is the this is an interesting energy scale, or this is an interesting distance scale um, and that then narrows your search. So I don't think at the moment, I mean, OK, there are quintessence models that give you evolving equations of state and you could map one of those onto and, and rule out others and say these are the ones that match the observations but i think in terms of the bigger picture that's what that observation would do for you hi for the um tests in galaxies you said that particular dark matter halos would sink less than stellar disks would that constraint be weakened if the dark matter halo were made from for example asteroid math primordial black holes yes that that is the the caveat um i said it was independent of your dark matter model that's not quite true um yes you need for for that observation to be true you need your fifth force to be pulling on your dark matter um and if it's if your dark matter is made of black holes those black holes don't have scalar charges, so your fifth force is not going to see them. So turning it around, if you were ever to see that signal, that potentially then would tell you something about the nature of your dark matter component as well. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, very good. Well, cool. thanks to Claire again. And now just before lunch, there are a couple of announcements that Santi will tell you about. Okay, so uh, I've already posted this uh, announcement in Slack, but I noticed that we are missing at least 100 people in Slack. So please join Slack because it will be for quick announcements, we will post them there, okay?
So if you don't know what this is, uh, we sent an email on the 4th of September, so seven days ago, uh, with instructions to join Slack, please do so. Uh, some people were asking about the tour tonight. Uh, it is still possible to join, but please contact the agency, which is in charge. I posted all the details in the emails and in Slack. Uh, they're in charge of everything, so they need to know if suddenly like 10, 15 people more are coming because maybe they need another guide or something. But it's still possible to join, okay? Uh, it's, and it's five years. Uh, for the dinner, um, some people were asking about accompanying person, so they can join, but please uh, send the form today. So they need to fill up the form, choose in the menu. And if someone hasn't confirmed the dinner yet, it's the last chance to do it, okay? So you need to go and fill up the form. And uh, I think that's all for me. Also, uh, I mean, we already posted this, but remember that you're supposed to send the slides the day before you're giving the talk, especially for parallels, because otherwise it's pretty hard to keep track of all the parallels. And then I pass on to Mateo. Say so again, please remember the slides. Some of you are supposed to give a talk today and we still do not have the slides. So please send it to us to the Cosmo Gmail address, as you know. A couple of announcements about allergies. So if you're among one of those who has allergies, that's gonna be in the cafeteria, the same we use for coffee. It's going to be a table with a black tablecloth. There's going to be food on top of that. That's reserved for allergic people. If you're not one of them, please just let it be. I'm going to the, um, the other structure, the one that's outside, the one that's artificial has been assembled. You can see like in those few days, the one in the proper, uh, in, the one in the IFT proper, uh, it's for allergic people. And uh, again, if you're allergic and you're joining us for the dinner, there is a tag for you in Monica's office. I think Monica's office is number 16 on the B16 on the ground floor, on the same floor as, as we're, we're at now. There are, going, there are going to be some tags that you can take from uh, Monica and put it on your table at the dinner so that the restaurant knows it's you and that they, they can take care of you properly. Other than that? So we reconvene almost in two hours. So quarter to three, we are in Spain. <laughs> so see you soon.